spiritual records, for divine truth, we leave this branch of evidence to proceed with the second part of this book. Is the Earth a Globe? Part 2nd Chapter ZEI Demonstrated evidence is that Chtb is not a globe. When producing the most infallible evidences in regard to unscriptural tenets or dogmas, which have long been held, and quite universally believed, notwithstanding the evidences and tests that may have been demonstrated by an axiom, and is virtually evident to the child of twelve years, we are met with something like this, why have not the savants of the world found this out before? Do you know more than all the wise men that have lived before you? We have no reputation as a philosopher, astronomer or a savant, to sacrifice. We have no stakes driven or anchor cast that we cannot take up for demonstrated truth, and facts evident to the degree of sense and reason that we possess. It has been stated, and perhaps honestly supposed, that either the globular theory of the formation of the earth, or the earth a plane, could be proven and sustained by the scriptures. But the infallible evidence that we have previously produced in the forepart of this work, is sufficient to silence any just entertainment of such an idea. That no two facts or truths disagree, having been our motto, we, therefore, laid our foundation for proof of our position from the scriptures in the forepart of our work. We now start on this branch of the subject, with that which we believe to be the true laws of science and mechanism and that which will be sustained by the infallible word. We have been taught that this earth is a globe, approximately 8,000 miles in diameter, consequently about 25,000 miles in circumference. This circumference necessarily forms a curvature of 8 inches to the mile, this is accepted, and is the acknowledged standard by all surveyors, engineers, navigators and astronomers of the world who believe the so-called Newtonian theory. This amount of curvature to the mile on a circle of 25,000 miles, may be, and has been proven correct, not only by figures, but by draft or diagram. If it is desirable to demonstrate the matter by draft on a regular scale, we give the following for those who have not the knowledge or experience of a practical draftsman, for the convenience of the mechanic or anyone who may have a scale graduated to hundredths of an inch, let them strike one fourth of a circle, which radius shall be forty inches, this represents one inch to every one hundred miles, consequently, the hundredths on your scale represents the miles on your diagram. From the center draw a vertical and right angle parallel line to the periphery of the arc, you now have a geometrical quadrant of the circle you now have a right angle whose two sides are 40 inches each, next draw a tangent line from each end of the arc, and square the arc, you now have an arc 40 inches square, the radius of which is equal to its sides, or 40 inches. From the periphery of the arc run 40 lines, one inch apart, vertical and horizontal to the edge of the square. This being done you have a diagram, which, if accurately drawn, gives the amount of curvature, or divergency from the vertical in miles. While this diagram does not give the fractional part of a mile on so small a scale, yet it is quite satisfactory, in round numbers showing that the accepted system of calculating the curvature on a circle 25,000 miles is correct. Further on we give a scale less complicated that may aid in the construction of the above that about briefs of the surface of the supposed globe or water, we need not stop to prove. And sauces slash are as this is the case, so sure the waters conform to that curve and make three fourths off the surface of the globe. Whether the waters are in a canal, ditch, lake, or ocean, whether a body of water one inch in depth, or three miles in depth, whether it is the weight of a feather, cobweb, or a thousand tons, whether it be at the supposed poles qf the globe, where the motion could be only half the motion of the hour hand of the clock, or 1000 miles an hour at the equator, all must conform to that curve, and those motions, all must be held in position by the same attraction, or force. But before we speculate further, or multiply wonders, let us see if we can prove that water has no curvature convexity. 
If we fail to do this, we fail of sustaining our faith and position. In order to get a straight line we must first get something that does not conform to any curve whatever, in any direction, in the least particle. Where, and what shall we take to test this matter? Happily, there are two things that can be demonstrated to be straight, the rays of light and the line of sight. If there remain the least doubt in regard to the first, take a straight stick and a lamp, and see if you can throw a shadow around the corner of a square box or cube. If, in regard to the second, there remain a question, just see if you can see around the corner of the house or over the top, by any device, try a crooked tube, if you please. We admit that reflection and refraction, either, may produce an image of a substance. But not the real substance. Mr. Webster says that a straight line is the shortest distance between two given points. Grant it, and who can give a better definition? But it will be interesting to follow Mr. Webster a little in his definitions of his geometrical lines, and notice how straight he works. He defines a level thus, not having one part higher than another, even, flat, smooth, horizontal, a line everywhere parallel to the surface of still water. He also says, it is a curve, the center of which coincides with the Earth's center, a horizontal line or surface. All waters conform to the curve of the Earth's surface. Here Mr. Webster calls a level a curvy and conforms it to the supposed curve of the Earth. Now, we will notice what Mr. W. says in another place, under the head of curve, as especially giving a definition of the word a line of which no three consecutive points are in the same straight line. And who could give or ask a better definition? It is, without doubt, the evident conception of every intelligent mind in regard to a curve. But, Mr. Webster, you have just defined a level as not having one part higher than another, you also say it is a curve. We have no railings against the much honored professor, but leave the matter for the time with the reader, to draw such conclusions as best he can. We venture to assume, however, that he has followed a hypothetical theory, taking things for granted without a demonstration. But these conclusions of Mr. Webster are inevitable to all who take the Newtonian theory, that even, flat, smooth, horizontal, a line or plane, is everywhere air parallel to still water, and again he says, a curve is a line of which no three consecutive points are in the Sari straight line, viz. That a straight line or the shortest distance between two given points, is a curve, conforming to the curve of the earth. Then, Mr. Webster, we would ask which way, or to what part of the earth, does a vertical line conform, drawn through the center of the supposed globe. Figure 6 is a diagram and proportionate scale showing the amount of divergency there would be circumnavigating a globe 8,000 miles in diameter, also the amount of convexity there would be above an air or straight line drawn from point to point on a globe. Figure 6. We will now start at the left hand upper corner at A and go to B, we have certainly gone down to C on the vertical, and D is the chord of the arc, or the convexity existing between point and point, A and B. Again, start at A and go to E, we have descended to F on the vertical, and the convexity is BB or one fourth of the distance from A to F. On the periphery of the arc the radiating lines are equally distanced apart, while A, C, F, J and the radiating point shows the actual amount of increase downward there would be in sailing around a globe whose poles are vertical, or even inclined, as claimed. At N, the equator if sailing north or south the ship is vertical, if she changes her course, and sails at right angles with the ship's compass, she is then on beam's end and at right angles from her former position. By this scale we demonstrate to an infallible certainty, first, that the amount of divergency as we go from the prime vertical, is 8 inches multiplied by the square of the distance. Example, let 15 miles be the distance 
15 times 15 equals 225 times 2 equals 450 minus 3 equals 150. See table for curvature. Second, that the amount of convexity between two given points on any circle is, approximately, one fourth of the divergency. See diagram, figure. 6. The above rules are the accepted ones by scientists of the day and for the first thousand miles the divergency or downward tendency increases at a greater pro rata, while the apex of the convexity or chord of the arc ever remains the same ratio to distance. We will notice another standard work in regard to this straight and curved line theory. The Encyclopedia Britannica says, the amount of curvature or diverging from the vertical increases as the square of the distances. That the curvature of the Earth is 8 inches for the first mile, 32 for the second mile, comma, and so on. In other words, square the diameter, multiply the product by 8 and divide by 12, if you wish it in feet and inches. This formula is the accepted one throughout among navigators, astronomers, etc. But we will just now inquire in regard to a level. A line drawn at right angles, crossing the plumb line or vertical, and touching the earth's surface is a true levelly in that particular spot, but if the line which crosses the plumb be continued for any considerable length, it will rise above the surface, and the apparent level will be above the true one. Now, there are things that are apparent that are true, also things apparent and yet unt we shall, therefore, try to make demonstrated facts appear as such. As we have before alluded, there is a standard to which all intelligent people who have eyes, whether cross-eyed, nigh or far-sighted, may resort for proof, viz. The line of sight and the race of flight it is a fact which no astronomer, surveyor or engineer will deny or question, that the theodolite telescope and level of the surveyor, conforms to and coincides with the spirit level, and these coincide with the line of sight which does not conform to the supposed curve of the Firth or to any curve whatever, apparent or unapparent. For the convenience of the readers of these pages we give a table which will show the amount of curvature, from 1 mile to 100, in feet and fractions thereof. The same may be found in any standard work on geodesy or geometry. To find the curvature in any number of miles not given in this table, square the distance by itself, Multiply that product by 8 and divide by 12, the quotient is the curvature required. Another simple and short method is, square the distance, of which the amount of divergency is required, multiply the product by 2 and divide by 3. Example, distance 20 miles, 20 times 20 equals 400, 400 times 2 equals 800. 803 equals 26633 feet, or 266 feet 8 inches. The hill or apex of curvation between point and point, as a matter of course, would be just one fourth the amount of divergency downward from the vertical of the two points in question. See also diagram and explanation, figure. 6. We now offer a few facts which have been demonstrated and may be repeated by anyone so disposed, that fully illustrate, and also corroborate the impossibility of convexity to water, or in short, of the Earth's being a globe. I have on my table a profile map of the canals of the state of New York, recently procured of the state engineer and surveyor, at Albany, N. Y. This map shows the elevation of the water's surface and the length of each level, or distance between each lock on the Erie Canal, also the altitude of each level above tide water at Albany. Now, according to this state survey of which we know no negative questio, there are two so-called levels of the following lengths, the longest level being 62 miles between the locks at Lockport and those at Rochester. The fall of water on the line of 62 miles is 3 feet in the entire level or cut, whereas if the earth were a GL6B 25,000 miles in circumference and the proper allowance be made for curvature, there would be a divergency from either end of the cut of 2,562 feet 8 inches, according to the accepted formula given, or diagram figure.
6, or the apex of the arc of that distance would necessarily be one fourth that amount, equaling 640 feet, minus 18 inches, allowance not made for the 3 feet fall in the level. The next longest level on the Erie Canal is between Syracuse and York Mills, and it is 52 miles without lock or gate, it is 428 400 to 1000 feet above the level of tide water at Albany, the altitude being the same at each end, and throughout the cut it is straight, on the bottom, conforming to the line of sight by the surveyor's theodolitine transit level. There should be in the latter case according to the Newtonian theory, a divergency in the 52 miles of 1802 feet 8 inches, or an intervening convex of 450 feet 8 inches. Test SOO Lake Erie I will now give my own experimental tests as to the convexity of the waters of Lake Erie. On July 4, 1887, Whilst standing on the bank of the Niagara River and near its mouth, I concluded that I saw a point of land, known as Lighthouse Point, on the south shore of the lake. My suppositions were questioned by some standing by, and I was informed by an old seaman that it was 30 miles to Lighthouse Point, and that it lay by line of sight behind another prominent point, known as Sturgeon Point, the latter about 20 miles. Anxious to settle the matter beyond doubt, I took a pocket field or marine telescope, and in a few hours, about 10 a. m. via. l. s. and m. s. r. r. I arrived at Silver Creek, a village of two or three thousand inhabitants, Lighthouse Point being about one half mile from the railroad station or the village. I there found a Mr. A. E. Arnold, a civil engineer of the Nickel Plate Railroad, and engaged him to go out to the point, taking his to transits or theodolites, to take a level of the waters and make such observations and demonstrations as our instruments would furnish. As we reached the prominence and point extending into the lake, I discovered the smoke of some steam craft up the lake and just at the horizon line, the smoke was all that could be seen by the unaided eye. Before directing the large transit to the object, we went down from the elevation some 25 or 30 feet to the water's edge, and set the legs of the instrument in the water's edge, so that when leveled, the telescope stood about 5 feet above the water. As the instrument was directed, I said, Have you got it? Yes, says Mr. Arnold. Does the line off sight intersect the water? says a bystander. No, was the reply of Mr. Arnold. Previously to setting the telescope, Mr. A. had judged the vessel to be twenty miles or more distant. How far do you now think the vessel is? I asked. About ten miles, was replied. How far down would ten miles put the vessel? I asked. 10 miles would require a divergency of 66 feet, 8 inches, according to the formula. Mr. Arnold, seeing this, says, how high are those propellers, Mr. Gleason? About 60 feet from the water to the top of the smokestack. And yet you see the entire vessel from the top of the smokestack to the water beating against her bow. After making due allowance for the five feet of the transit above water, according to the formula we would not any more than see a very small portion, if any, of her smokestack. I don't understand it, says Mr. A. Now, please direct the instrument to the Canada shore, said I. This being done, I was invited to look through the level telescope, and as I now have before me a government marine chart, giving all points and distances on Lake Erie, I give the same according thereto. From the point where we stood to the well and canal on the Canada shore is 22 miles, and from the same point of observation to the mouth of the Niagara River my first starting point, is 27 miles. We could behold the land at intervals all along the Canada shore to the mouth of the Niagara River, or the northern portion of Buffalo.
the land showing under the cross line of the telescope, indicating the same, as near as we could judge, on one shore as on the other, the sea being quite smooth, we could judge approximately. The line of sight, or point of compass, from the mouth of the Niagara to Silver Creek, or Lighthouse Point, is S E by I E and this line of sight lacks just one mile of intersecting sturgeon point, which has been suggested to me as a barrier preventing the sight of the point, but this is not the case. An old and true adage is, you cannot have two hills without a hollow. It is equally true that there cannot be two points on a globe without a hill or convexity between. Again, according to the globular theory, also according to geometrical demonstrations by actual draft, in the 27 miles the line of sight from either end of the distance would strike the water at about 5 miles, should the parties stand at the water's edge, and run above the heads of each about 400 feet. See diagram, figure. 7. It is true and obvious to every practical draftsman that it is necessary in order to represent feet or even many miles of so large an object as the earth, that our diagrams cannot, in detail, be given correct, therefore, they are exaggerated, and some have accused us of doing this to mislead, but judge as you please, the plain figures will tell the truth, though the diagram may be only an illustration of our ideas. Suez Canal, a hundred miles level. We will now look at the waters of the deep where the Spirit of God moved, and performed the first act of his creation, so far as the earth is concerned, at least. General. I colon 2, 3. Where he founded and established it. Psalms 24, 2. In the Encyclopedia Britannica there is an elaborate description of the Suez Canal, with detailed maps, drawings, etc. This canal connects the Mediterranean Sea with the Gulf of Suez and the Red Sea, and furnishes a fair sample between theoretical and practical engineering. The canal is 100 miles in length and without locks throughout the entire length, so that the waters within it are simply a connection and a continuation from sea to sea. The average level of the Mediterranean is said to be 6 inches above the Red Sea, yet the flood tides in the Red Sea rise some 4 feet above the highest and its ebbs fall nearly three feet below the lowest in the Mediterranean. The datum line of the canal is 26 feet below the level of the Mediterranean, and is continued level, horizontal, from one sea to the other, and throughout the whole length of the work, the surface of the water runs parallel with this datum line. This datum line is just what fixes the matter and establishes the difference between what science preaches and what she can or three nor dare practice. Book of British Standing Orders Slash In the British House of Parliament, in London, is the following standing order, accompanied by a diagram, the only diagram in the Book of Standing Orders. Apostrophe Ordered by Lords, Spiritual and Temporal in Parliament Assembled That the section be draw to the same horizontal scale as the plan, and to a vertical scale of not less than one inch to every one hundred feet, and shall show the surface of the ground marked on the plan, the intended level of the proposed work, the height of every embankment, and the depth of every cutting, and a datum horizontal line, which shall be the same throughout the whole length of the work, or any branch thereof, respectively, and shall be referred to some fixed point stated in writing on the section, near some portion of such work and in the case of a canal, cut, navigation, turnpike or other carriage road or railway, near either of the termini. But why, my lords, this J4 standing order? It seems that the inference may be a just and conclusive one, that at some previous date engineers or surveyors have made a bad job by allowing for curvature, and in so doing it has taught their lordly science a lesson from which this legal standard is established. True theory and practice run very close together, but here we notice that education experimental, has forbidden, by law, the two to blend. Let us imagine for a moment what the result would have been in the case of the cut of the Suez Canal had they followed the fondly cherished Copernican theory. 
In order to properly illustrate this matter of curvature we have slash made the following diagram. Demonstrated evidences. 275. Let the arc from B to B, in figure 8, represent the 100 miles, length of the canal. In the 100 miles we have gone down 6,666 feet 8 inches. The chord of the arc would be I, 664 feet between A and CC. Figure 8. Now, we will start in the middle of this work at A and go either way to B, and it is evident, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that we have descended on the vertical from A to CC, and made a cut or hole in the earth I, 666 feet at either end of the arc BB and from D to D is the chord and apex of the arc, showing a convexity of one-fourth of the divergency, or 414 feet in the 50 miles from a B. To speak without exaggeration, a thousand parallel cases might be given, but if we let hypothetical theory run away with our senses, then demonstrated facts have no bearing on the point. We are satisfied that we have abundantly proven that the Earth is not a globe semicolon yet, we would not like to ignore some of the most commonly supposed reasons and alleged demonstrated facts to the contrary. In Elements of Astronomy, by Lockyer, p. 82, published by Appleton and Company. 1883 is an illustration of five vessels at various distances from the shore to the horizon line and beyond, as shown in the first diagram following. This he gives to demonstrate the globular shape of the earth. He says, moreover, if we watch ships putting out to sea, we loose first the hull, then the lower sails, until the highest part of the masts disappears. If the surface of the earth were flat, or an extended plane, this would not be so. We would not like to flatly deny what Mr. Lockyer may see with his theoretical vision, and thousands of others who never gave the matter a demonstrated dist. Yet, we can give our testimony as one who has been only about two years a seafaring man, and since that time our attention having been called to the practical demonstration of the matter, we have always been able to behold the sails at a greater distance than we could see the masts. If we divide a circle into 360 degrees, the usual and accepted rule, the angle from the parallel or vertical from the center to the circumference is the same, regardless of the diameter of the said circle, though the farther we go from the center the greater the divergency of the lines from each other or wider the space. We make these remarks for the benefit of those who are not acquainted with geometrical terms and facts. Now, the angle of diminution of our vision, or that of the average EI is about the same as that of one degree, or about the same ratio or angle of a digfi. To further demonstrate the theory, stand in the middle of a railroad track, where the track is straight for one mile, and though it be upgrade, you will find the rails appear to meet at a mile or less. This will fairly illustrate the convergency and diminution of sight. One thing let us notice and bear in mind, the horizon line is ever on a level with the eye, as will be illustrated further on, and as we are viewing a vessel from the shore we are lifted up from the level of the waters, and between us and the horizon line in the distance is the dark blue water, as a background covering the vessel's hull, and as the sky, when clear, is lighter than the water. It furnishes a background on which the outlines of the objects are more distinguishable than the waters which are ever below the horizon, the level of the eye. This cut is no exaggeration of the view of the vessel on the horizon be the telescope. We have in company with others watched the vessel receding until it had entirely disappeared, and with a field or opera glass partially restored it to sight and at the same time have used the telescope of forty powers which would restore the vessel to the water's edge. Were the earth a globe this would not be so. But what is the matter with Mr. Lockyer's theory? Yea, the Copernican or Newtonian entire. All say that the vessel has gone over the hill and disappeared. Now, what has the telescope done? Has it brought the vessel nearer to us, or has it taken us nearer to the vessel? or has it enabled us to look over the hill or around the corner? In other words, 
has it not simply lengthened out our vision? I prefer to believe the latter. But one more illustration with the telescope, we go out of a starry night, we behold the seven stars, we put the telescope to our eye and within the radius of the seven stars, if our telescope is a powerful one, there are more stars than we are able to count, or at least we are not able to distinguish the seven from the multitude. Again, what have we proven by this? Simply, that we have extended our short vision to meet the focal or vanishing point of the stars whose rays lacked a few miles of reaching our vision, or that part of the earth that we inhabit. Will we still believe there is a hill between us and the vessel? Another oft-repeated and supposed objection to the earth being a plane is the following, by Mr. Lockyer, p. 83, again, the roundness of the earth has been proved by navigators, who, sailing in one direction, east or west as nearly as the different bodies of land would permit, have returned to the place from which they set out. This, to my mind, is about the weakest point that I ever observed in a so-called scientist a publisher and writer of astronomical school books. Mr. L. knows, or should know, that navigators on the great seas sail by a compass whichever points to the north center and the south circumference. He should know that if he stands with his back to the north pole or center, that his face is to the south circumference, no matter where on the earth or seas he may be, whether in South America or Asia. Now, in sailing or traversing the earth by a compass, east to west, you would keep your course by keeping at right angles with the compass, whose attraction point is ever north, and is it any more unreasonable to expect that you would arrive at the same place in going either way, if you continue on the same latitude or the same distance from the center, than it would be to expect that if you take a mechanical compass, on a flat board or square block, to scribe a circle. Go either way you arrive at the same point. The point or object that is movable simply goes greater around a center, regardless of the shape of that on which it moves. But should the navigator start south from any part of the earth, and continue his journey, what would be the terminus? It would be the everlasting bounds of ice. No navigator ever went farther, or even as far as 80 degrees south. The magnetic current and attraction of the earth and seas is to the aerial or geographical center of the earth and seas, and not 4,000 miles beneath our feet. This we shall endeavor to demonstrate more fully further on. We will return to Mr. Lockyer, on page 83, article on sensible horizon. On all sides of us we see a circle of land, or sea, or both, on which the sky seems to rest. This is called the sensible horizon. If we observe it from a little boat on the sea, or from a plane, this circle is small, but if we look out from the top of a ship's mast, or from a hill, we find it greatly enlarged. In fact, the higher we go, the more is the horizon extended, always, however, retaining its circular form. Now, the sphere is the only figure which, looked at from an external point, is bounded by a circle and as the horizons of all places are circular, the earth is a sphere, or nearly so. We have given the entire paragraph, we shall now see how much of it is sensible, and how much is not logical or true. Limit of vision and horizon considered. On our next page we show a diagram, figure 11, by which we illustrate the extent of vision. First, it will be conceded and borne in mind, that there is a limit to the vision, and a limit to every light that ever shone. Every person stands in the center of his own vision, and under his own genit semicolon he can see just as far one way as he can the other, there being no obstructions the length of the vision is varied to some extent by the conditions of the atmosphere. Now, we ask what it is that really constitutes our horizon? Why are we always encircled, as it were? in a spherical dome or semicircle. Simply because our vision scribes it, it is the end of our vision, nothing more, nothing less. The scopia of the vision is about 60 degree, the angle or diminution about 1 degree, as heretofore stated, therefore, the vision must have a focal or vanishing point. 
the horizon, then, is formed be the end of our vision, and the obstruction of our vision by the land or seas. And further, this sensible horizon has no more significance to the earth's being a globe or sphere, than the hands of the clock, or the scribing of a circle with the ordinary mechanics or mathematician's compass. Mr. L. also states that the higher we go, the more is the horizon extended. This will also prove to be a false conception by considering the diagram figure. 9. The testimony of every aeronaut is, that as they arise from the earth, the earth seems scooped out, or concave, in the room of convex, as it should be, were Mr. Lockyer's theory true. We will now start with the man in the balloon, figure. N. His horizon is represented by the dotted line from the balloon to a and 6 is his zenith. He rises to 2 on the vertical line. The length of his vision is just the same, his horizon is E and it has drawn into B, he rises to 4. His horizon is G, and his sight or original horizon has drawn into the junction of G and A, he next arises to 6. His horizon is H, his zenith is D, his hot 7% un is H, and his original horizon has drawn into the junction of DA. Now, would the atmosphere admit of the possibility of ascending to 8, he would be out of sight of the earth, his zenith would be the same distance as ever, yet there would be nothing to distinguish his horizon, in fact, he now has none, but he is in the radial center of his vision as usual, with sky all around him. But a few words in regard to seeing objects better the higher we go. This is true to a limited extent only. As we rise from the earth, we change the angle of our vision relative to things on earth or sea, but we see no farther, unless by rising we get above objects that obstruct. The horizon is ever the same distance to the same unaided eye, in all places, wherever you are, and under the same conditions of atmosphere. Every individual who is blessed with natural vision has, so to speak, an orbit of that vision, that orbit is not an eclipse, but a perfect sphere, and so is every light that ever shone. It will be interesting to observe the testimony of a few noted aeronauts on this subject, believing that those who have had demonstrated optical vs off the earth when at an altitude above the clouds, would be as good judges of the appearance of the earth beneath them, as those who have sat in their official chair and written a flowery essay upon the appearance of the heavens and the earth. Doubtless, this may be to the satisfaction of themselves and our schoolboy days, but all this is not quite satisfactory to him who requires demonstrated evidence of these things. The apparent concavity of the earth as seen from a balloon. A perfectly formed circle encompassed the visible planisphere beneath, or rather the concave sphere it might now be called, for I had attained a height from which the earth assumed a regularly hollowed or concave appearance, an optical illusion which increases as you recede from it. At the greatest elevation I attained, which was about a mile and a half, the appearance of the world around me assumed a shape or form like that which is made by placing two watch glasses together by their edges, the balloon apparently in the central cavity all the time of its flight at the elevation. Wise is aeronautics. Another curious effect of the inner ascent was that the earth, when we are at our greatest altitude, positively appeared concave, looking like a huge dark bowl, rather than the convex sphere such as we would naturally expect to see the horizon always appears to be on a level with our eye, and seems to rise as we rise, until at length the elevation of the circular boundary line of the site becomes so marked that the earth assumes the anomalous appearance, as we have said, of a concave rather than a convex body. Mew's Great World of London The chief a peculiarity of a view from a balloon at a considerable elevation was the altitude of the horizon, which remained practically on a level with the eye, at an elevation of two miles, causing the surface of the earth to appear concave, instead of convex, and to recede during the rapid ascent, whilst the horizon and the balloon seemed to be stationary. London Journal, July 18, 1857 Mr. Elliot
an American aeronaut, in a letter giving an account of his ascension from Baltimore, thus speaks of the appearance of the Earth from a balloon. I don't know that I ever hinted heretofore that the aeronaut may well be the most skeptical man about the rotundity of the Earth. Philosophy imposes the truth upon us, but the view of the Earth from the elevation of the balloon is that of an immense terrestrial basin, the deeper part of which is that directly under one's feet. As we ascend, the earth beneath us seems to recede, actually to sink away, while the horizon gradually and gracefully lifts a diversified slope, stretching away farther and farther to a line that, at the highest elevation, seems to close with the sky. Thus, upon our clear day, the aeronaut feels as if suspended at about an equal distance between the vast blue oceanic concave above the equally expanded terrestrial basin below. During the important balloon ascension, recently made for scientific purposes, by Mr. Coxwell and Mr. Glacier, of the Royal Observatory, Greenwich, the same phenomenon was observed. The horizon always appeared on a level with the car. See Mr. Glacier's report, in Leisure Hour for October 11, 1862. The plane of the Earth offers another delusion to the traveller in the air to whom it appears as a concave surface, and who surveys the line of the horizon as an unknown circle, rising up, in relation to the hollow of the concave hemisphere, like the rim of a shallow inverted watch glass, to the height of the eye of the observer, how high soever he may be, the blue atmosphere above closing over it like the corresponding hemisphere reversed. Glacier's Report, in Leisure Hour, for May 21, 1862. The appearance referred to in the several foregoing extracts is represented in the foregoing diagram, and with the exception of the cuts, which are our own, may be found in Zetetic Astronomy, by Parallax, pages 36 to 38. The surface of the Earth appears to rise up to the level of the observer in the car of the balloon and at the same time, the sky CC seems to descend and to meet the Earth at the horizon BB. The above is the universal testimony of all aeronauts we have ever read, and we have several others. But we will not annoy with overabundant CF testimony, but will stop by asking the reader how he thinks the above statements harmonize with Mr. Lockyer's theoretical vision. But we have not yet got ready to abandon this balloon ascension, it furnishes good evidence in regard to the convexity question. We have stopped in the midst of the subject and made a correct diagram, that we might illustrate the matter with certainty. In the following scale, the 150th ISO, of an inch, represents a mile, both in altitude and circumference, relative to a globe. Letter OO represent the prime vertical of a globe. DD represents a right angle from the vertical. The man in the balloon has ascended from D on the vertical line, 2 miles, to the arrow point I. In order to look over the earth, the line of sight from the balloon would strike the earth at arrow points 5 and 3, therefore, the horizon would be just 170 miles distant, and in the place of being on the level with the eye of the observer in the balloon, from arrow points I, 2 as previously stated by the aeronauts. We find Mr. Lockyer's sensible horizon, by looking on the line of E, E, arrow points 5 and 3, 19,266 feet 8 inches below the starting point at P, D, and about 5 nautical miles, a nautical mile is 6,075 feet, therefore, we multiply 6075 times 5 and it gives 30,375 feet as the actual difference between the actual observers, and the ideal vision of a sensible horizon. In view of the above facts and hundreds of others that we have examined and might be brought forward, we are forced to say that so far as the earth and seas are concerned, the convexity sought for cannot be found, for lo, it does not exist. A few more thoughts may be worthy of consideration in regard to the law of perspective. It will be obvious to the thoughtful mind that space diminishes with the objects as they recede in distance. 
the two rows of lamp lights in some of our long streets in Chicago and other cities, will appear to converge at a distance of two miles or less, owing to the width of the street. Now, we are apt to forget that this diminution of our vision decreases at the same ratio vertically as it does horizontally. The closer two objects, or more, are to each other, the sooner they become one appearance as they recede in distance. Again, let us remember that the vessel's hull when at sea is on and apart in the water, which, together with the focal and vanishing point of vision, constitutes our horizon line, and is the absolute termination of our vision in that direction, therefore, just as fast as that body the hull of the vessel, continues to recede, just so fast that hull will continue, little by little, to disappear, always the lower portions of the vessel first. Let diagram figure. 14 illustrate. Let A represent the surface of the earth, and E E the lower serrata of atmosphere, C D C the upper serrata, and P P the arc of the heavens. The observer at A is in the center of his own vision, and he sees the rising and setting sun's rays, obliquely, and through a greater amount of atmosphere at S C E than at I and 2, or at any other points on the diagram. However, there are conditions of atmosphere that must be taken into consideration with these thoughts as well as the conditions of the optical vision of the beholder. At the earth or on the sea the air is more aqueous, particles of vapor in solution are in compound parts of greater quantity than at a high elevation. This is one of the reasons why an object is to be seen at a greater distance from our high latitudes, as in mountainous countries, than they otherwise would be. In all very high altitudes sight is conveyed to a greater distance, but sound much less. For instance, Pike's Peak which is 14,147 feet above the level of the sea, is seen from Denver or that vicinity, the latter of which is some 8 or 9,000 feet tap of the level of the sea, and according to the railroad time and distance tables, it is 82 miles from Pike's Peak. Yet, we are told by travelers on those railroads that Pike Speak is seen at a distance 130 to 150 miles from other very high peaks, and this is reasonable with the law of perspective when the different altitudes are taken into consideration with the rarefied atmosphere through which they look. Bayard Taylor gives an account of an ascent made in some of the mountains of Europe, by himself and escort, to an altitude of so little or light an atmosphere, that it was says he, with difficulty that we could hear the report of a revolver fifteen feet semicolon at that demonstration we made haste our retreat for blood oozed from the pores of the skin, at the lips and nostrils. Again, we are asked, why does the sun look so much larger at sunrise or sunset, than he does at noon? If he is ever the same distance from the earth, why should he not appear the same size, or even less? The foregoing will explain. The Horrors Degree Zero Line, by Dr. W. M. Herbertham. The author has seen and tested this apparent rising of the water and the sea horizon to the level of the eye, and to an eye line at right angles to a plumb line, from many different places, the high ground near the race course at Brighton in Sussex, from the several hills in the Isle of Wight, various places near Plymouth, looking towards the Eddystone Lighthouse, the steep home in the Bristol Channel, the hill of Howth, and apostrophe Islands I, near Dublin, various parts of the Isle of Man, Arthur's Seat, near Edinburgh, the cliffs at Tynemouth, the rocks at Crimmer, in Norfolk, from the top of Nelson's Monument, at Great Yarmouth, and from many other elevated positions. But in Ireland, in Scotland, and in several parts of England, he has been challenged by surveyors to make use of the theodolite, or ordinary spirit level, to test appearance of the horizon. It was affirmed that, through this instrument, when leveled, the horizon always appeared below the crossbear, as shown in figure. 15, cc the crosshair and h the horizon. In every instance when the experiment was tried, this appearance was found to exist, but it was noticed that different instruments gave different degrees of horizontal depression below the crosshair. 
the author saw at once that this peculiarity depended upon the construction and adjustment of the instruments. He ascertained that in those of the very best construction and of the most perfect adjustment, called technically collimation there was a slight divergence of the rays of light from the axis of the eye, on passing through the several glasses of the theodolite. He therefore obtained an iron tube about 18 inches in length, one end was closed, except a very small aperture in the center, and at the other end cross hairs were fixed. A spirit level was then attached, and the hole carefully adjusted. On directing it, from considerable elevation towards the sea, and looking through the small aperture at one end, the cross hair at the opposite end was seen to cut or to fall close low the horizon, as shown at figure. 16. H. H. This has been tried in various places, and at different altitudes, and always with the same result, showing clearly that the horizon is visible below the crosshair of an ordinary leveling instrument and is the result of refraction from looking through the various glasses of the telescope, for on looking through an instrument in every respect the same in construction, except being free from lenses, a different result is observed and one precisely the same as that seen from a balloon from any promontory, and especially in the experiment at Brighton. In order to verify the above statement, the author of this book procured a surveyor's leveling instrument of Mr. Henry Lyon, of Buffalo, and then procured permission of the city officers, or those in charge of the city hall, to ascend to the roof the hall being one of the highest buildings in Buffalo, the top of which is over 150 feet above the level of the Lake Lake Erie at the mouth of Niagara River, and affording a fine view of the city and of Lake Erie to the utmost extent of the vision. Here upon the roof it being a flat roof or nearly so, I placed and adjusted the instrument and swung it to the sea, Anna observed a space of about one eighth thirty six of an inch between the horizontal line of the instrument and the horizon proper, as shown in figure. 15. I next swung the line of sight to the Canada shore, and found the line cut the tops of some of the very highest trees. Knowing that the Canada shore, at the point to which I directed the leveling instrument, was fully equal, if not higher than the ground on which the city hall stood, I felt pretty sure that the instrument was in good adjustment because I was looking across a body of water to a point of land, some ten miles or more distant. Having previously been upon, and passed the said point of land by water, I could judge approximately as to its relative height above the water. I next went down from the city hall roof and went to the foot of Georgia Street, about as near the level of the water as I could conveniently get, and there adjusted the instrument a second time. When leveled I found that the crosshair or horizontal line of the level struck the banks of the lake at intervals along the Canada shore to the terminus of the point of land before mentioned, but, as I swung the level to the horizon line formed by the sea and sky, I could not distinguish any difference in the space existing between the cross line and the horizon from near the water's edge, than that carefully observed at the top of the city hall. This not only confirms and agrees with Dr. Herbertham's statements, but those of the writer, illustrated by figure 11 on page 281, and in fact, every other demonstration made. Next, in order to establish, as well as to put this horizon line question beyond the shadow of a doubt, we procured of the mathematical instrument maker a sighted and graduated level, having no lens. We then repaired to the lake shore near the city water works, there being a bluff at that point of about 60 feet above the lake and harbor. Here we set our level and found it to sight exactly on the horizon line at sea. We next entered the city water works, being connected there with an observatory of some 50 feet more elevation. From this elevation, at last, to speak safely, we were 100 feet above the water level, and here we find the level when accurately adjusted, to point directly on the horizon line. I think that the majority of scientific engineers and coast surveyors understand this rise of the horizon line, but I am surprised to find so few, if ever in one inland surveyor, that really understood that the center of his vision, both vertical and horizontal, was the axis of his eye.
And yet, I am more surprised to find such men as Lokaya, who are considered scientific authority, saying, now the sphere is the only figure which looked at from any point is bounded by a circle and notice his illogical conclusion, and as the horizons of all places are circular, the earth is a sphere. See Lokaya's astronomy, p. 83. Pog. 161. These comparative experiments cannot fail to satisfy any unbiased observer, that in every leveling instrument where lenses are employed, there is, of necessity, more or less divergence of the line of sight from the true or normal axis, and that however small the amount, perhaps inappreciable in short lengths of observation, it is considerable in distances of several miles. Every scientific surveyor of experience is fully aware of this and other peculiarities in all such instruments, and is always ready to make allowances for them in important surveys. As a still further proof of this behavior of the telescope poor leveling instrument, the following simple experiment may be tried, select a piece of ground, a terrace, promenade, line of railway, or embankment, which shall be perfectly horizontal, for say, 500 yards. Let a signal staff five feet high, be erected at one end, and a theodolite or spirit level fixed and carefully adjusted to exactly the same altitude at the other end. The top of the signal will then be seen at a little below the cross hair alt it has the same actual altitude, and stands upon the same horizontal foundation. If the position of the signal staff and the spirit level be then reversed, the same result will follow. Another proof will be found in the following experiment, Select any promontory, pier, lighthouse gallery, or small island, and, at a considerable altitude, place a smooth block of wood or stone of any magnitude, let this be leveled. If then, the observer will place his eye close to the block of wood, and look along its surface towards the sea, he will find that the line of sight will touch the distant horizon. Now, let any number of spirit levels or theodolites be properly placed and accurately adjusted, and it will be found that, in every one of them, the same sea horizon will appear in the field of view considerably below the crosshair, thus proving that the telescopic instrumental readings are not the same as those of the naked eye. Dr. Herbertham continues. In a work entitled A Treatise on Mathematical Instruments, by J. F. Heather, M. A of the Royal Military College, Warwick, published by Wheel, High Hoban, London, elaborate directions are given for examining, correcting and adjusting the collimation, etc. And at page 103 of the above-named work, these directions are concluded by the following words, the instrument will now be in complete practical adjustment for any distance not exceeding 10 chains 220 yards the maximum error being only eight to one thousand of a foot. At this stage of the inquiry two distinct questions naturally arise. First, if the earth is a plane, why does the sea at all times appear to arise to the axis of the eye? And secondly, would not the appearance exist if the earth were a globe? It is a simple fact that two lines running parallel for a considerable distance will, to an observer placed between them at one end, appear to converge or come together at the other end. The top and bottom, and sides of a long room, or an equally bored tunnel, will afford a good example of this appearance, but perhaps a still better illustration is given by the two metallic lines of a long portion of any railway. In figure 17, letter B and CD represent the two lines of a straight portion of horizontal railway. If an observer be placed at G he will see the two lines apparently meeting each other towards H, from the following cause, let G represent the eye, looking first, as far along as figures I and 2, the space between I and 2 will then be seen by the eye at G, under the angle IG2. On looking as far as figures 3 and 4 the space between 3 and 4 will be seen under the diminishing angle 3G4. Again, on looking forward to the points 5 and 6, the space between the rails would be represented by the angle 5G6, and, 
as will at once be seen, the greater the distance observed, the more acute the angle at the eye, and therefore the nearer together will the rails appear. Now, if on these rails should be an arc of a circle and diverge from the other, as in the diagram figure 18, it is evident that the effect upon the eye at G would be different to that shown by the diagram figure 17. The line G four would become a tangent to the arc CG, and could never approach the line GH nearer than the point T. The same may be said of lines drawn to six, opposite five, and to all greater distances, none could rise higher than the tangent point T. Hence, allowing a B to represent the sky and CD the surface of the water of a globe, it is evident that a B could appear to decline or come down to the point H practically to a level with the eye at G, but that CD could never, by the operation of any known law of optics, rise to be line of GH, and therefore, any observation made upon a globular surface, could not possibly produce the effect observed from a balloon, or in any experiment like that represented in figs. 12 and 13. The Man in the Balloon. From the foregoing details the following arguments may be constructed. a. Right lines, running parallel with each other appear to approach in distance. b. The eye line, and the surfact of the earth and sky run parallel with each other. c. Ergo semicolon the earth and sky appear to approach in the distance. d. Lines which appear to approach in the distance are parallel lines e. The surface of the earth appears to approach the eye line. Slash, ergo, the surface of the earth is parallel with the eye line. g. The eye line is a right line. b. The surface of the earth is parallel or equidistant. i. Ergo, the surface of the earth is a right line, a plane. Not a globe, nor sphere or spheroid. t. L. E. sucks motion concentric with to be polar center. As the earth has been proved to be fixed see cut figure dot 3, the motion of the sun is a visible reality. If it be observed from any latitude a few degrees north of the line called the Tropic of Cancer comma and for any period before or after the time of southing, or passing the meridian, it will be seen to describe an arc of a circle. The following simple experiment will be interesting as demonstrating the fact that the sun's path is concentric with the center of the earth's surface. Let the observer take his stand a few minutes before sunrise in the month of June, or any of the summer months will be better than winter, as the results will be more striking, on some elevated point, where he can see a clear horizon line east and west. Let him draw a line due north and south, and a second line due east and west across the first. Now stand with his back to the north. Being thus at his post and ready for observation, let him watch carefully for the sun's first appearance above the horizon, and he will find that the point where the sun is first observed is considerably to the north of east, or at the line drawn at right angles to north and south. If he will continue to watch the sun's progress until noon, it will be seen to ascend in a curve southwards until it reaches the meridian and thence to descend in a westerly curve until it arrives at the horizon and set considerable to the north of due west, as shown in the following diagram, figure. 19. An object which moves in an arc of a circle and returns to a given point in a given time, as the sun does to the meridian, must, of necessity, have completed a circular path in the twenty-four hours which constitute a solar day. Demonstrated Evidences 297. Noon de Sui. To place the matter beyond doubt, the observations of Arctic navigators may be referred to. Captain. Parry and several of his officers, on ascending high land near the Arctic Circle repeatedly saw, for twenty-four hours together, the sun describing a circle upon the southern horizon. Captain. Beachy writes, few of us have ever seen the sun at midnight and this night happening to be particularly clear, his broad red disc, curiously distorted by refraction, and sweeping majestically along the northern horizon, was an object of imposing grandeur, 
which riveted to the deck some of our crew who would perhaps have beheld with indifference the less imposing effect of the icebergs. The rays were too oblique to illuminate more than the irregularities of the flows of the ice, and falling thus partially on the grotesque shapes, either really assumed by ice or distorted by the unequal refraction of the atmosphere, so betrayed the imagination that it required no great exertion of fancy to trace in various directions architectural edifices, grottos and caves, here and there, glittering as if with precious metals. In July, 1865, Mr. Campbell, United States Minister to Norway, with a party of American gentlemen went far enough north to see the sun at midnight. It was 69 degrees north latitude, and they ascended a cliff 1,000 feet above the Arctic Sea. The scene is thus described. Apostrophe it was late, but still sunlight. The Arctic Ocean stretched away in silent vastness at our feet. The sound of the waves scarcely reached our airy lookout. Away in the north the huge old sun swung low along the horizon like the slow beat of the tall clock in our grandfather's Padre corner. We all stood silently looking at our watches, when both hands stood together at twelve, midnight, the full round orb hung triumphantly above the wave, a bridge of gold running due north spangled the waters between us and him. There he shone in silent majesty which knew no setting. We involuntarily took off our hats, no word was said. Combine the most brilliant sunrise you ever saw, and its beauties will pall before the gorgeous coloring which lit up the ocean, heaven and mountains. In half an hour the sun had swung up perceptibly on its beat, the colors had changed to those of morning. A fresh breeze had rippled over the florid sea, one songster after another piped out of the grove behind us, we had slid into another day. Parallax is earth not a globe, pps. 105-107. FL Midnight Polar Sunday Theories are of no certain character. He who builds his hopes upon a hypothesis, because of its pleasing nature and relative to his fairy dreams, as did the Copernican astronomers, is sure, sooner or later, to find his foundation is but sinking sand, and his hope that of the traveler's mirage in a desert land. Honesty of thought is to look truth squarely in the face, without fear of its contradicting itself, or destroying our preconceived opinions. Then, to think honestly, is to think freely, and allow not the desire to run away with the thought, nor master that thought based on an axiom. He who does this, has predetermined what he shall believe. The amount of evidence, and weight of argument on such a mind, may be justly compared to water poured upon a duck's back. Notwithstanding the existing fact, of the varied minds of men, we will proceed with our demonstrated method of proving our way as we go. First, it is a well-known fact by all northern navigators, that the sun can be seen at midnight, from the northern portion of Hudson's Bay, Bering Strait, and the southern portion of Greenland, and all of those points south of the Arctic Circle. The latter is undeniable existing facts, regardless of the shape of the Earth. Second, another undeniable existing fact to thousands of people on land and sea, is this, the sun never reaches a latitude north of the equator, exceeding 23,030. The Tropic of Cancer is well known to be the northern limit of the sun's vertical position, from the 21st to the 20 to D of June. Third, it is well known by all nautical almanac makers of our government, and others, that just 450 from the sun's daily path is seen at noon, at an altitude in the arc of the heavens of 450 to the child we would say, explain halfway between the horizon and the zenith. This, then, will give a geometrical explanation for squaring our circle in order to get the relative position of the sun from the earth. And further, how the sun can be seen at angle of 450 altitude from either side of it at all times, wherever 450 distance places the beholder, is more than I am able to tell, and I have never been able to even find an intelligent person to attempt the task. This, however, will be more fully set forth in the next chapter. In figure. 
Twenteen following let the dotted circle A represent the sun's path around the earth horizontally, and concentric to the north center N, 90, but never rising any above the 2y slash to degree, its position on the diagram, which is known to be the case by all people living on the Tropic of Cancer, it passing through India, Arabia, Egypt, Africa, Bahama Isles, Mexico and many islands of the Pacific Ocean and Chinese Empire. Now, let us examine the corroborative testimony of Captain Parry and his several officers as given under figure 19, and especially the United States Minister to Norway, Mr. Campbell, who took their position 1,000 feet above the RTC, in 69 degree north latitude, in the month of July, after the sun had commenced to recede from its extreme northern limit. The following diagram, figure 20, will more fully set forth the matter in its true light. First, let us take our position on the 1000 feet elevation on the dotted line 69 degree arc and arrow line BB. We now find that we have a body of earth and water, over 1000 miles above the line of sight BB and more than the radius or half the diameter of their supposed globe. But the nearest approach to the center, ever made by man who returned to tell the tale, was Sir Redward Parry, who, with open boats, advanced in toward the north to the latitude of 80 to degree 45, or to the proximity of 435 miles from the north center, commonly called the Pole. The dotted line at 82 degree 45 is the relative position of Sir Edward Parry, and we find the line of sight would pass through a body of the earth equal to about 3000 miles or more. But suppose apostrophe that he were at the very center and they claim it a great basin scooped out to a depth of some 10 miles, but so much the worse for their theory, those who have the truth can afford to be liberal he would have to reach an elevation on his supposed pole of more than 10 miles to the line of sea in order to see the sun even on the horizon. Thus we see again and again the inevitable results, of a hypothetical foundation. Be sun's altitude. For it is TLE truth. He can reason intelligently only from what we know, and we are all dependent on universal history of all past time for much of our present knowledge is procured from the experience of the ancients. When secular and profane history corroborates prophecy, both become to us facts. History tells us that the ancient Greeks believed the sun to be about 30 miles distant above the earth. In the early days of Copernicus, who was born at Thorn, on the Vistula, February 19, 1473, it was believed to be about 1000 miles. During Copernicus' lifetime it advanced to three millions of miles. Sir Isaac Newton had it fifty-four millions. In 1754 it was taught to be between eighty-one and eighty-two millions. A million or two did not make much difference, anyway. Today it is claimed, by some, to be ninety-one, and by others one hundred million miles distant from the earth, and its rays of light to extend two hundred millions of miles and it's like to travel that distance in one second of time. Today, the man that would presume to show a logical solution of these paganistical conglomerations of ideas, by a plain, geometrical process of logical reasoning, is pounced upon by news vendors and editors, using all sorts of epithets to show his would-be wise indignation for the one who dare to attack, what the editor styles are long established, beyond the shadow of, doubt and impeachable facts slash and warns his unsuspecting readers against such nonsense, and whimsical attempts to mislead those not informed, etc. We have no time to waste with those who find it more satisfactory to revile with sarcasm and to prove our position incorrect, but will invite all who feel so disposed to follow us through our two articles which bring to light the consistent or inconsistent teachings of the principles of modern science as compared with the most ancient in regard to the subject in question. How shall we arrive at the truth concerning these statements and conflicting ideas? Ands. That which can be physically and mathematically demonstrated, or we will say in synonymous terms that which can be geometrically and mechanically proven.
the architect or the inventor having conceived in his mind a structure, is not positive of that structure meeting his mind in all points until he has obtained a draft on a proper and convenient scale, by which he measures all its parts and considers its relations, the one point with all others, and a little further, if you please, a model, a miniature, or a standard representation, is to him the demonstrated truth or a type of the truth. One more style of truth we would use in our argument, and that is axiomal, self evident, and is just as infallibly the truth as it is, that the sun rose or set yesterday. We will ask the reader to be patient with us, and go slow, and we will try to use no more words than is necessary to make our argument conclusive, and safe to follow and understand, whether you believe or not. The evidence above mentioned we will now bring forward. First, we will present the former, the mechanical, and say to you behold a miniature drawing or diagram of the earth in figure 21. The first and inner circle is the representation of a globe. By squaring this globe at the four cardinal points, we produce an angle of 450 and establish a double quadrant at every corner. We also establish the latitude of 450 air and north and south, which are company equal in distance from the north, south and equator BBBB. Right here let it be borne in mind that these lines and angles or degrees all bear the same relation to each other and relative proportions on this scale, as they would though the drawing were many times larger, or as large as the supposed globe itself. And now for our universal axiomal fact, everybody knows that knows what an almanac teaches, that the sun is vertical, plumb over the equator, bb, on the 21st and 22nd days of September and March, respectively, one day on one side of the north center, and the next day on the other. The people living on the equator certainly know the latter to be true. Now, whether the earth be a globe or a plane, one thing more we know, the people living at Ottawa, Canada, which is 450 north latitude, and the people in South America at 450 south latitude, see the sun at 12 o'clock noon, at one and the same time that it is vertical on the equator. Where do they see it, and at what angle in the heavens? Answer, 450 altitude, which is, to be plain figure. 21. To all, halfway between the horizon and the zenith plumb overhead. Now, in all fairness and honesty to all scientific intelligence and mechanical skill, we declare this drawing or diagram, to be according to the so-called science of the globular theory, and risk our small reputation be for the world with the declaration. Now, if from BBBB is the base or horizontal lines from the four cardinal points or sides, then certainly RRA, over the 450 is the vertical or plumb line it is the zenith to the locality of the 445s. From this construction it will readily be seen, by every person who has any mechanism in their head. If they will notice, the small angles of 450 at the 45s call them quadrants if you please, simply produce company equal parallel lines to each other, and dotted lines NBS. Let us follow this matter a little further, don't get tired too quick. While the people at the equator be see the sun over their head at noon, where do the people at 450 north see the sun? Answer, on their own base or horizon line, just setting, that is, providing that each sees the same sun. Next, where do the people at 450 south see the sun? Answer, on their own base line, just rising. Again, as there are just 24 hours contained in a complete revolution of the sun, how many hours of sun would the people have while the sun would be going from A to A, or B to B? Answer, 6, no more, no less. In view of this demonstrated fact, namely, that if the sun is seen at an angle of 450 north and 450 south at the same time vertical on the equator, then there must be three suns. But it is said by some that the sun is much larger than the earth, and that the people on one side see one edge, and the people on the opposite see the other, etc. Yes. Let us see, again, 
The globular scientists claim the sun to be 800,000 miles in diameter, and we must hold it at the angle of 450 from the two co-equal latitudes, for there is where they both see it, and there the visions or lines of sight cross, and there it is, there is the center. But hold. The lower limb of the sun is hanging just 400,000 miles below that center. It would wipe the earth out of existence in its first revolution. With these aforesaid lines running parallel and 3,000 miles apart, the sun only covering an angle of a little over half a degree or 35 miles, all told. You might look on the 450 n, latitude and 450s. Latitude, at an angle of 450 for the sun to all eternity, it could not be sunned while the sun was on the equator. It is presumption in the extreme. We have placed the sun just where the squaring of the circle demands it must be, and still be at 450 altitude where it is known that it is. Now we know of no other principle that will carry out the problem and meet the conditions, and certain it is, that this does not meet the well-known requirements and facts in the case. It is also evident, inasmuch as we have seen by the above demonstration, that the sun could not be seen simultaneously at the three places by an observer on a globe, that this earth is not a globe. The only conditions by which the sun can be seen from the localities named or any other locality 450 from the actual locality of the sun's daily path, is given in an article written by the author of this book for the Buffalo Times, and published November 16, 1890, which we give in part below. We present another diagram, figure 22. This is simply to quadrants or right angles whose base is 450s. And 450n are equal to the vertical or plumb line O, which repera times 5s, fis hash O to J845n cents the equator. The two hypotenuses longest lines of the angles whose base is respectively at 450 south latitude and 450 north latitude when raised at an elevation of 450 of the arc of the heavens. Each determine the sun at that point 90 degree. We now have the matter in a nutshell. It is a nail in a sure place. It is too plain not to be understood, that all who know the diameter of the equator the sun's path or the diameter of the supposed globe, can know the distance from Ottawa. Canada, 450 north latitude to the equator, and all do know that 450 latitude and 450 altitude, or in other words, the base and vertical are equal. While we are aware of the many phenomena that are supposed to be explained to be derogatory to the zetetic or the earth a plane, we know of no principle or law, and believe that there is none known to man that will exclude or supersede the principle of the quadrant or right angle whose base and vertical are equal. When we know the number of the degrees that we have gone on the base and have reached the apex by the line of sight, then if we know the measurement of these degrees, we know the whole story, the problem is virtually solved. The base and vertical of the quadrant are simply two radio for circle and we may as well declare that the two points of the compass will not determine the center and the circumference of a circle as to ignore this principle, this is the principle of measuring distances across rivers, without crossing or the altitude of any object unattainable otherwise, it is the process of measuring by parallax. It is as infallible a principle as the finding of the two ends of a rod or beam in order to determine its length. We have determined by these evidences given, that we have no use for the transit of Venus to prove the distance of the Sun from the Earth, its transit has no more to do with it than has a transit of the Beltline passenger train going around the city of Buffalo. The Sun's Distance By Lewis Swift, Ph. D.D. Warner Observatory, Rochester, N. Y. V. S. A. The writer feels that he would be doing injustice to all parties concerned were he to ignore the most eminent writers and so-called scientists of the present day. To such as are unacquainted with Professor Swift, I can do no better by them, in giving an introduction to the gentleman, than by giving a few quotations from his writings.
and in due honor to the gentleman will say, that I believe it is universally understood that Professor Swift is one of the leading lights of the Newtonian system of astronomy, and as we shall see, an adherent to Kepler's laws. We make no attack upon the gentleman, but it is the system that we propose to portray and compare parallel with that which we have endeavored to set forth. And we will further add that we believe the professor rightly represents the globular theory, and rotundity of the earth. We will commence on page 3, second paragraph of the professor's simple lessons in astronomy under the head of the solar system. The solar system is comprised of the sun and of all the bodies, by whatsoever name they may be called, which periodically revolve around him as a center. The known limit of the planetary system is the orbit of the planet Neptune, but it would not greatly surprise an astronomer at any time to hear that an extra Neptunian planet had been discovered. The extremes of the planetary system then as recognized by astronomers, are Mercury, the nearest, and Neptune is most distant from the Sun day. This limitation does not include the hypothetical intramercurial planet or planets discovered by Professor Watson and myself during the total eclipse of the Sun in 1878. The names of the planets in the order of distance from the Sun are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, the groups of the asteroids, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Apostrophe apostrophe Mercury and Venus have no satellites, the Earth and Neptune have one each, Mars has two, Jupiter and Uranus have four, while the ring planet Saturn, has eight. Apostrophe all the planets revolve around the Sun, and as far as known rotate on their axes in the same direction, from west to east, as also do all the satellites, except those of Uranus and Neptune, which revolve around their primaries from west to east, or opposite to the motions of the hands of a watch. We have paused until the fourth paragraph has run its length, and here let us have a few words. We notice in the above paragraphs, first, that which comprises the solar system is in paragraph third, as stated, eight primary planet, having all told, twenty satellites, Uranus four, and Neptune one, making five, or one fourth of the whole number, which revolve in a contrary direction from the hypothetically established laws of gravitation, and Kepler's laws or any other man's laws of centrifugal and centripetal forces. Including the primary planets, there would be 23 besides the asteroids, five of which are running in contradistinction, adverse to all known, or at least explainable, by inherent principles. This, it seems, should be sufficient to annihilate the whole Newtonian system but it seems that there are always a large majority of that class of people who like to be duped, and prefer fairy tales to solid facts. But we will listen to a couple of paragraphs of the eloquent professor. Every member of the solar system, be it planet, satellite, meteoroid or comet, moves in an orbit called an ellipse. Though the orbits of the planets and their satellites differ in form but little from the circle, yet not one is known to actually describe that most beautiful of all curves. The ancients were loath to believe that God would cause or permit the planets to move in any other orbit but the perfect circle, but as soon as they broke away from that delusion and adopted the elliptical orbit, they found that computation and observation agreed at all times, while before, they agreed and disagreed periodically and so they do yet. For this the world is indebted to the genius of the immortal Kepler, who brought harmony out of confusion by the first of his three laws of planetary motion. 10 Is the Earth a Globe? Chapter Ziv Motion of every kind presupposes a moving power. This solar system, whose center is the sun and whose circumference extends halfway to the nearest star, is filled with worlds, every one of which is in motion. Motion seems here and everywhere to be almost an attribute of matter. There is not in the universe a particle of matter, be it a world or a molecule, which is at rest dot and that the sun can hold at arm's length, as it were, such huge globes as Jupiter, 
Saturn and the other planetary and cometary bodies, and swing them around their orbits with such undeviating exactness that for millions of ages has not for a single instant relaxed its firm hold, is a striking example of the mighty influence which attraction, next to God, the presiding genius of the universe exerts on enormously distant worlds. But where, O oh tell us, where shall rest, sweet rest, be found? For this, says the professor, the world is indebted to the immortal Kepler who brought harmony out of confusion be the first of his three laws of planetary motion. But we will ask the professor to just state something of the characteristics of Mr. Kepler, what were his views? The following are the views of Kepler, who, though one of the founders of modern astronomy, possesses in his character the Strijad mixture of exalted greatness and incomprehensible weakness, which latter evidenced itself in mystical speculations. It was he who taught that the planets were arranged in accordance with musical concords, Jupiter and Saturn taking the bass, Mars the tenor, Venus the treble, and Mercury the alto, from which has a is in the expression the music of the spheres. He it was also who believed the earth rested on a turtle, whose breathings in and out of the waters caused the ebb and the flow of the tides. Mr. Swift, what do you consider the underlying principle of your whole system? But though the author of these and other astronomical absurdities, he made his name immortal by the discovery of the three laws of planetary motion, which underlie all our later astronomical knowledge. Such is the opinion of the renowned D. 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 in regard to the value of the individual judgment on whom all seem to stand or fall, so far as the universally accepted system of astronomy is concerned, and on that which his knowledge is founded. In order to satisfy the public that we were not using simply our own individual ideas, of the sun's altitude and dim scenes, we wrote Professor Swift on the 12th of September, 1889 and received the following statement. Apostrophe apostrophe Warner's Observatory. Rochester, N. Y. U. S. A. September. 14, 1889. J. Dear Sir, the altitude of the sun's lower limb at noon at Buffalo on September 21st will be 470,238, and the upper limb 47 degree 3436. Yours truly, Louis Swift. We suppose if we had asked the Reverend Doctor the diameter of the sun's disk in just so many words he would have kindly given it as he has taught others in his simple lessons of astronomy namely, 886,000 miles. Now if we subtract 238, from 3436, we have 3238. This is, of course, on the equator, and occupies a little over half a degree, which corresponds to about 35 miles for the sun's diameter. This latter statement by the professor is as all other scientific observers gives it and we would like to see them harmonize the 35 miles with 886,000 or the 2,000 or less with 93 million, botgy of which the Reverend Professor freely gives, and at the altitude as given on the equator, and the diameter as he has given it, its lower limb would wipe the earth out of existence at one revolution, and its upper limb would clean the firmament above. Another infallible evidence that the earth is not a globe, is this, the sun being determined at these angles they determine its distance, also the amount of the surface of a globe that it could possibly cover at own and the same moment of time, would be just six hours, or one fourth of the earth's surface. Thus, we limit the 24 hour day to six hours sun and 18 hours darkness. There is no evading these conclusions. If, from the day that we observe the sun at 450 north latitude, and at the angle of 450, we travel south 10 miles each day, for just 90 days we will find the sun at the angle of 450 each day. The sun has then reached the southern limit, we can then start back at the same rate, and for 90 days more keep it at the same angle, thus determining the fact that the sun ever remains the same distance above the earth. 
and as the sun travels in a spiral orbit from north to south, and vice versa, at the rate of 10 miles per 24 hours, and makes two and one half consecutive revolutions at each solstice or termini, it never leaves the termini at the point where it entered it, consequently, does not run back exactly in the same track or cross the meridian lines in just the same place in the one journeying that it does in the other, thus accounting for the difference between sunrise and noon, and noon and sundown, which is known to exist, also, its journeying to and from accounts for the change of the seasons. On September 12, 1890, we addressed a second letter to Professor Swift, asking for the altitude of the sun on the 21st and 20 to D of that month at Ottawa, Canada, and received the following reply. Dear Sir, south of the equator meridian altitude equals company latitude to declination. North of zenith to pole meridian altitude equals latitude polar distance. Below the pole it equals declination to company latitude. Thus. Pole. 90. Apostrophe latitude of Ottawa. 45. Company latitude of Ottawa. 45. Declination of Sun O. -O. Meridian altitude of Sunday 45 on September 22. Yours truly. Lewis Swift. Inasmuch as we prefixed our article at its head Sun's Distance, by Professor Lewis Swift, in justice to the gentleman, we will quote his own words from his own book Simple Lessons in Astronomy, page 88. Now the diameter of the Earth's orbit is I 86, chi o miles, and its radius is half of that amount or 93 million miles the Earth's distance from the Sun day. We may ascertain its place by taking half its displacement as observed from the two extremes of the Earth's orbit at an interval of six months, or 186,000 miles apart. This gives the radius of the circle or baseline of a triangle. As, therefore, 93 million miles are equal to a radius or 306,265, I, will equal 206,265 times 93 gu comma o o o equals 19, 182 billion 645 million miles, a distance which an express train of 40 miles hourly would require nearly 52 million 500 thousand years to traverse. This explanation shows why, if the parallax of a star does not equal I, its distance is at least 206,265 times that of the Sun, and probably much more, as we cannot be certain of the accuracy of any measurements below I of arc, an exceedingly small quantity with which to deal, only I to I, 296,000 of the circumference of the sky. But what if in the supposed diameter of the Earth's orbit of 186 millions of miles 186 million, we find no parallax displacement, as many of the Newtonian, Kepler and Copernican school affirm? What would the natural conclusions of a class or company of professed scientists, who had established an observation of a known star or fixed point in the heavens? after a ride of 186 million miles from their starting point, and then on the second observation find that they had made no progress. The star no farther, no nearer. Could they not justly conclude that their once united brains, if any they had, had now become one united conglomerated mux as Josh Billings calls it, caused by the whirling and spinning of that terrible machine and wonderful piece of mechanism, the globe during that six months journey of 186 million miles. But this we say and we will give their own words, that not more than the 91 to 100 part of a second of arc was ever claimed by the most sanguine adherents, and this denied by the more considerate. We will give you just one quotation at this time. The diameter of the Earth's orbit is 200 million miles Professor. Swift says 186 million miles. Well, 14 million miles is not much difference, anyway, 
yet we can detect no difference in their apparent places, viewed from the opposite points of this diameter, a change of place amounting to a second would be detected by the accuracy of modern observations. Yes, surely, if there any existed and they should come as close as the above. Encyclopedia Americana, Article on Astronomy, p. 433. In order to make Professor Swift's letter of September 12, 1890 which we gave a few pages back, plain to those unacquainted with astronomical terms, we here will give a diagram that will more intelligently fix in the minds of those unacquainted with the absolute facts as they do exist. Without any reference to actual distance according to measurement, we give the relative position of four established points, that are not dependent on the theory of man for their affixed position. They are as self-evident as that which the Creator gave to rule the day, and bring to man the return and the change of our seasons, and until he who rules and reigns above shall otherwise decree, they will so remain. Before calling attention to the diagram, I will say that three of the above named points are so established and so ordained by the Creator, that they are accessible and of daily evidence to a great portion of the human family. In figure 24 we will commence our illustration. Let N represent the North Center, commonly called Pole. This is north to every man on earth, no matter what his location may be. Let E E represent a cross section of the equator through the North Pole N. Let the sun be on his circuit through the heavens, and his well known position on the 21st and 20 to D days of March and September respectively, which is E E. We now have a fixed point, the equator, number? I. We next take F F, which is midway between E and N on either side of N, and it is 450 N. Being north of the equator and company A equal in distance to the equator on all sides of their north center, and this establishes the fixed point number. 2. The latter no informed person will question. Now, right here, bear one thing in mind worthy of ever retaining, for here is established points that will be brought into requisition further on, and ever after, namely, the people who live at 450 on both sides of the north center, and in fact all the way around the north center, and at all times of the year behold the north star at a maximum angle of 450 altitude. We will mention the well inhabited countries through which this line 450 north passes, on which all people behold the north star at a maximum altitude of 450 in the heavens and the sun the same on the aforesaid days of the year, September 21st and 20 to D and March 21st and 20 to D. They are as follows, Tkistan, Turkey, Russian Empire, Romani, Austria, Italy, central portion of France, southern Canada, northern part of the United States and the Chinese Empire. Therefore, certain we are that we have one more nail in a sure place, and have established a fixed point. Number 3. And whilst we are here, before we leave this point, kind reader, let me suggest a thought, suppose for a moment that N is the apex of an Egyptian pyramid, or a cone, whose angle of its sides in all places is just 450, now place good marksmen all the way around the pyramid at its base, and let there be a small target close to the apex, at a given signal all are expected to fire at the target and he who misses his mark, under equally favorable conditions, is not worthy the honor of a sharpshooter. Now, where would these men be most likely to aim? Would they expect to hit the mark, should they fire into the horizon or the zenith? Would they not aim along the line of the sides on an angle of the pyramid? We will let you consider this at your pleasure, but will say further, that in the diagram, Lig. 24. 450 ff and 450 ss, all sustain the same relation to e the equator, as the above illustration does to the north center, and this establishes a fixed point, number 4. A few words in regard to 450 ss, now, ss maintains the same relation to e as does ff, heretofore described, but the relations that 450 ss sustains to cc, no human being can tell. 
the ice belt is found at between 540 and 56 degrees south, 78 degree 10 being the greatest extent ever reached by man. This was Sir James Ross, of whom we will speak in particular further on. So far in this chapter we have only been able to give you the distance of the sun from the earth according to the Newtonian theory, together with Professor Swift's figures and statements, which are acceptable generally with that system. As we have seen, if two astronomers of the Newtonian school come within 14 million miles of each other as to the result of their estimations, it is very close. However, we trust that the reader who has followed us patiently, will have a good understanding of the relative position that we sustain to the sun and the north center. We have not as yet given our figures for the altitude of the sun, nor the north star, nor the diameter of the equator, but having established our bearing at the equator and north pole, if we allow the north center to be 90 degree, which is claimed, and we will so estimate for a while yet, surely 45 is half of 90. But in this we are estimating on the principle of the earth a globe, which we have found will not do, we have proved it a plane, and as it is a physical inconsistency and a literal impossibility to make the diameter equal to the circumference, so it is impossible to have the same number of degrees in the diameter or radius of a circle, and still have those degrees company equal in length. I scale of Tphi Solar Sister Below we give a true scale of the solar system which will demonstrate the matter still farther. First, we affirm that there are but 57 company equal degrees in the radius of a circle. See figure 25. The following scale of the solar system. As we have seen that there are but 57 degree in the radius of a circle, we are now ready to commence to measure, and as the equator see figure 25 is a fixed point we will commence there. We will take 150 on the equator for our measuring rod, which is acknowledged to be 900 miles. 60 miles per degree. Now, as we have before seen, that from 450 n. Our angles were company equal to all points in question, we the place our 450 in name, but not in fact. Why? because 28 degrees equal half the distance from the equator to the n center and vice versa, and those 28% degrees equal 1725 nautical miles, to either the north pole or the equator, and the 1725 miles equal the altitude of both the sun the north star semicolon and times 1725 miles equal 6900, the diameter of the equator. The dotted circular lines and the one dotted vertical are given to show where the meridian lines would come in case it should be claimed that the degrees of latitude are equal to the degrees of longitude, which, as we have proven, are not admissible. In the above we have determined these distances by the most rigid geometrical process. We believe it as immovable as the rock of Gibraltar, and there remains one more point unexplained in regard to the right angle quadrant, which we give for the benefit of those who may require it. When the base and vertical, or as some may term it, when the two sides of a right angle are equal in length the hypotenuse sustains the same relation to the two equal sides, as 170 to 120. This admits of no remaining decimals. For instance, the base being 12 inches the hypotenuse, intersecting the vertical, will be 17 inches. The sides will admit of equal proportions at this ratio, and no variations. Here are due many thanks to my conservative friends, who have kindly offered criticisms and cautious suggestions for which I am truly grateful, and hope ever for their continuation. Some of the Zetetic faith had given the sun's altitude 2500, some 3500, and some even less than I have given it. By what process they have arrived at the various results I do not know but I know of no other geometrical process than the last herein given. Extent and Form of the Sun's Rays 
While we have been able to prove from many infallible sources that the earth is not a globe, we have not always been able to account for all phenomena on the basis of either the earth a globe or a plane, therefore, we have had to let demonstrated facts rest, and wait patiently for further developments and additions, corroborating that which has been previously proven. One difficulty with the advocates of the earth a plane, has been to show night and day of equal length on the equator when the sun was on the equator. Namely, on March 21 to 22 and September 21 to 22. It is well known by all who have noticed our almanacs that for the latitudes of 350, 450 n. They give us equal length of day and night, March 15 to 17 and in September as late as the 26th. We also think proper to here state, that while some have confidently affirmed that equal day and night was on the 21st and 20 to D of March and September respectively, if they who live in the aforesaid latitudes will observe sunrise and sunset they will know for themselves, especially those who can observe it at sea. We herewith give three cuts, figs. 26, 27 and 28, which are, approximately, our understanding of the form of the sun's rays in his variations from one solstice to the other in the change of his seasons. We wish these to stand as correctors and substitutions of diagrams on pages 90, 92, and map on the 97th page of our former book, the first edition of Is the Bible from Heaven? Is the Earth a Globe? I will here give honor and credit to whom I believe it due for the advanced thoughts that have caused this production, and I cannot see why it is not logical and in harmony with other positive evidences of the earth a stationary plane. Mr. R. E. L. Love, of Vadis, W. Var. A scholarly young man, first gave me the ideas and a sketch from which I have developed what you may here behold in a brief description figure. 26, or June 21, shows the sun in his position on the northern or inner solstice, on the longest days we have north of the equator, in which his rays extend to the greatest limit. It will be noticed that we have furnished each figure with the 360 degree and the 24 hours divided and marked on the outer circle. The second circle marked 90 degree and beyond the irregular line, marked south ice no human being ever navigated, 78 degree Io is the greatest limit ever react south of the equator. Here are the everlasting bounds of perpetual ice. Figure 27, or December 21st, is the sun's southern limit, his rays should extend, longitudinally, some farther over his daily path, in order to account for the longest days south of the equator. Yet, this is only an approximate construction, and it is well known and will be proven further on, that the days in the extreme south do not correspond to the day's length in the north. Were the earth a globe they should be company equal. Figure. 28 or September and March 21st and 20 to D respectively, is the sun's equatorial position, and on the equator they have just 12 hours sun, and of course 12 hours dark. Were the sun so much larger than the earth, or should we behold the sun by refraction, in part, as is claimed by the globe advocates, then certainly there would be more than twelve hours soft on the equator, the like of which was never known. Explanation, we figure, 28. Often speak of the sun's being on the equator on the 21st of March and the 21st of September, then again speak of its being the 20 to D. This may be a query to some that have dissembled. Not given the matter consideration, but it may be remembered that the 180th meridian is the line established by civil reckoning for the change of date in crossing the day line. Thus, east bound a day is gained, west bound a day is lost. In fact, no actual time is lost or gained, but as the sun makes his complete circuit to a given meridian every 24 hours, there must of necessity, in a commercial point of view between the nations, as well as a legal civil law, be an established dayline. There must exist an acknowledged starting point, and the same must be the end. This part of the subject we hope to mention further on, 
but trust this will suffice for the apparent discrepancy in the above dates. But to return to our subject, the heading of this chapter. We will give Mr. Lovell's own words and logical reasonings for the shape and extent of the sun's rays. I fell into the channel of thought from reading the following in G. P. Quackenbow's Natural Philosophy, a chapter on optics, under division of bodies. No substance transmits light without intercepting some by the way. It is computed that the sun's rays lose nearly one fourth their brilliancy by passing through the Earth's atmosphere, and that if this atmosphere 45 miles, extended 15 times as far from the surface as it does, we should receive no light at all from the sun, but should be plunged into perpetual night. Now, light penetrates the rare body further than the denser. It also passes through the more transparent more readily than through the less transparent. Storms refine and purify atmosphere, heat expands it, and cold condenses it. The southern atmosphere is more transparent than the northern. The tropical or equatorial is expanded and more rare than the arctic. The sun's rays ever extend farther east of his center or nucleus, directly under his path in the heavens, than any other direction. Author. With these facts in the mind of the reader, we think the diagrams will be understood. The path over which the sun daily travels, and is rapidly moving, must of necessity be kept the hottest, and therefore the most expanded. The portion of the sun inside of the sun's path, that which is daily surrounded by the rays, or all north of the equator, receives greater benefits from the light than does that southern portion of earth and seas that are only passed by once in twenty-four hours, hence, the logical reason for more ice in the corresponding south latitudes than the north. And another phenomenon is apparently explained in the following, of the twilight, morning and evening, in that latitude, I give the respective words of two reliable missionaries from Australia and Borneo. Reverend. Father Johnson, a Catholic missionary says, we have from five to six minutes twilight morning and evening, it does not exceed the latter. Elder S. N. Haskell, S. D. A. Says, at Melbourne we make preparations for the night while we can yet see the sun, because when it is sundown it is dark immediately. Apostrophe. I suppose that the assertion immediately is in a relative sense he having been accustomed to our long twilight of an hour or more. Now, it is evident that were the earth a revolving globe with the sun at its equatorial center, there would exist company a equal twilight. Day's length versus north and south. Inasmuch as it has been stated by our globe favorites that the same condition of things relative to the length of days, long continued absence of the sun etc. existed and that the flat earth advocates failed to show by their demonstrations the actual condition of things as they are known to exist, we have decided to present a few well-founded and well-known authenticated facts to show their statements are without foundation. At Stockholm, Sweden, latitude 59,021 north, there is 183 hours Sunday. At Hammerfest, Norway latitude 70 degree 45 north, there is continual sun from May 11 to July 22 three months. At Spitsgen, 78 degree n. Latitude, the longest continued day is three and one half months. The longest day we are able to find on record in the south practically observed, is on pages 133 to 135 of Antarctic cruise, by Captain Wilkes. He says, on January 16 the sun set at a few minutes before 10 the effect of sunrise at a little after 2 o'clock, on the 23d was glorious. This, though not definite, would give them a day something over 19 hours length in the latitude 66 degree south. But to contrast, we give Saint Petersburg, CL usage latitude 59,056 n. 19 hours sun, the latter being about 6 degrees, are over 400 miles nearer the equator, yet, about the same length of day, each of these ever having their summer or longest days. 
but lately I received an official statement from Professor J. Morrison of the Nautical Almanac Office, Bureau of Navigation, Navy Department, Washington, D. C. In reply to my interrogations, he says. On December 21st and 20 to D at South Shetland, about 70 degrees south see any good map of the world, sun rises to H. 3 M. 30s. Sun sets 9 I 1. 56 M. 30s. Total 1911. 53 M. Longest continued day. Reverse the results for June 20 to D and we shall have for June 21st and 22 D sun rises 9 H. 56 M. 30s. Sun sets 2 H. 3 M. 30s. Total 7 H. 53 M. Shortest continued day. The above results are for the sun's upper limb, or for the very first and last rays of sunlight, and are absolutely correct. J. Morrison. From the above we have learned that at 78 degree north latitude Spitzgen, there is a summer in which the longest day is three and one half months. We will turn our attention again to the Antarctic regions, and shall find that of all the navigators on record, Sir James Ross has penetrated the farthest south. He reached the highest austral latitude of 78 degree 10. While we are noting an interesting expedition, or such portions of it as may be of interest to the reader, please bear in mind the fact that no record is made of any long sunny days during their summer months which are the most favorable seasons for South Sea expeditions. The French Antarctic Expedition In January, 1839, the French expedition under Darmont d'Urville, proceeded south from Tasmania and discovered two apostrophe small islands on the Antarctic Circle named Terdeli and Cote Clary. Apostrophe at the same time Commander Wilkes of the United States expedition made a cruise to the southward and mapped a large tract of land in the latitude of the Antarctic Circle, for which he claimed the discovery. But as a portion of it had already been seen by Balleny, and the rest has since been proven not to exist, the claim has not been admitted. The English Antarctic Expedition was undertaken in 1839 to 1843, mainly with a view to magnetic observations and the determination of the position of the South Magnetic Pole. Two old bomb vessels, the Erebus and Terror, were fitted out under the command of Captain afterwards Sir James Ross, with Captain Crozier in the Terror. The cruise for the second season was commenced from Tasmania south of Australia between 42 and 450 south latitude, in November 1840. The Auckland Islands and Campbell Islands were first visited and surveyed, and on New Year's Day, 1841, the Antarctic Circle was crossed in about 1720. A few days afterwards the two vessels were beset in the pack ice and began persevering and boring through it. By January 10 they succeeded, and were clear of ice in 70 degree 23 s. And next day land was sighted, rising in lofty peaks and covered with perennial snow. The day Ross passed the highest latitude reached by Cook in 1773, 71,015 s. On a nearer approach to the land there was a clear view to the chain of mountains, with peaks rising to 10,000 feet, and glaciers filling the intervening valleys and projecting into the sea the land interposed an insuperable obstacle to any nearer approach to it. Captain Ross landed with great difficulty, owing to the strong tide and drifting ice, on a small island near the shore, named Possession Island, in 71 degree 56 is. And I 7 I degree 70. Inconceivable myriads of penguins covered the surface, but no vegetation was seen. Next morning there was a southerly gale which moderated, and on the 18th of January they were again sailing south in an unexplored sea. No mention is anywhere made of extreme long days to correspond with company equal latitudes of the north, as there necessarily should be were the earth a globe. On the 23d they were in 74,020 s. 
and thus passed the most southern latitude reached by Captain Weddell in 1823. Sailing along the newly discovered coast Captain Ross landed after much difficulty on an island named after Sir John Franklin, in 76 degree 8. On the 27th they came in sight of a mountain 12,400 feet above the level of the sea, which proved to be an active volcano, emitting flame and smoke in great profusion. It was named Mount Erebus, and an extinct volcano to the eastward. 10,900 feet high, was named Mount Terra. Along the coast as far as the eye could reach to the eastward, there was a perpendicular cliff of ice from 150 to 200 feet high, perfectly level at the top, and without any fissures or promontories on its seaward face. Nothing could be seen above it except the summits of a lofty range of mountains extending southward as far as 790s. To this range the name of Parry was given. Captain Ross then sailed along the marvellous wall of ice eastward in 77,047 s. As far as 78 degree s. This barrier was estimated to be I, 0 feet thick, and it was followed for 450 miles without a break. The whole of the great southern land discovered by Sir James Ross was named Victoria Land. Imagine if you can the amount of centripetal force there must be concentrated to the center of a globe or sphere, to hold these mighty walls of ice and mountains of frozen material in place. Is not the statements of the prophet Job easily reconciled with the above? Apostrophe hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Declare if thou knowest it all. Job 38, 18. The waters are hid as with a stone and the face of the deep is frozen. 30th verse Job 26 colon 10. He hath compassed waters if bounds, until day and night come to an end. Author. In November, 1841, the Erebus and Terror again shaped a southerly course, entered the pack ice on December 18th summer, and once more crossed the Antarctic Circle on New Year's Day. The navigation through a belt of ice 800 miles broad was extremely perilous. At length, on the 1st of February, 1842, a clear sea was in sight, and they proceeded to the southward in 174,031 w. On the 22 d they were surrounded with lofty icebergs aground, and at midnight great ice barrier was sighted and its examination recommenced in 77,049 s. Next day the expedition obtained a latitude of 78 degree 10 s by far the highest ever reached before or since. After escaping imminent dangers, in navigating through chains of huge icebergs, Captain Ross took his ship northward and wintered at the Falkland Islands. Third Expedition In December, 1842, the expedition sailed from Port Louis on the third visit to South Polar Region seeing the first iceberg in 610s. On the 28th the ships sighted the land named after the Prince de Joinville by Dumont d'Ursville, and the south side of the South Shetlands was surveyed. During February about 160 miles of the edge of the packs were examined. On March NTH the Antarctic Circle was recrossed for the last time, and the expedition returned to England in September. 1843. Thus, after four years' most diligent work, the ably conducted and quite unperiled voyage to the South Polar regions came to an end. Two islands named Erd and MacDonald were also visited on this wise, November 1853, by Captain Hurd of the American ship Oriental. In February they were driven southward by a gale of wind and the first iceberg was discovered on the 12th and 60 degree 52 s. It was 200 feet high and about 700 feet long. On the 19th the ship was at a dense pack of ice in 65 degree 42 s. And on the 4th of March they bore up to Australia. Several deep soundings were taken, the greatest depth being I, 975 fathoms corresponding to about 3 miles. The route of the Challenger was much the same as that of the Pagoda in 1845, but more to the north. 
with it ends the somewhat meager record of voyages across and towards the Antarctic Circle. C. R. M. Encyclopedia Britannica, Volume. 6. P. 330. Antarctic Exploration. We understand by authentic statistics that the expedition of the Challenger and the reports of her crews cost the nation the extravagant sum of over one million dollars. This, the necessary result of which that government regards with cautious proposal as to any further scientific advances for any similar expedition. And it, we believe, expressed its discouragement of the proposed Antarctic expedition in connection with the Australian government. The Challenger did not openly admit that it had searched for the South Pole in vain. Oh, no, but it sailed three times around the world, or upwards of 60,000 miles without being able to say that it had been fortunate enough to ascertain the existence of any such wonderful locality. Of course, it may have gone on searching as long as its timbers or platings held together, and the same disappointment must have attended its efforts. Right here a thought or two may be suggestive to the reader, were the earth a globe or spheroid, inside of the Antarctic circle the degrees of longitude could not exceed 30 miles to the degree, but if we allow them 30 miles for adversities of winds, currents, ice, etc. and multiply 360 degree x 60 we have 21,600 in order to make a circuit of 10,800 claimed by all globularists. Yet, we can afford to be more liberal, we will call the multiplicator 120, and the product in miles will only reach 43,200, a little over two thirds of their nautical record as above, and most of this inside the Antarctic Circle. But after a circuitous cruise like the above record, and a fruitless expenditure of over a million of dollars, it seems quite natural for them to feel somewhat crestfallen in regard to their previous importunateness with the government, although the record does not state that they were in search of a South Pole, but our magnetic pole. Yes, and where did they expect to find it, if they found any such thing? And what did they expect to call it when found? A suggestion here will DP no harm, if it does no gopt. We charge nothing for our advice when it is not followed. The aforesaid expedition could have made just as great a failure, with less money. Two or three hundred thousand dollars expended in sending one expedition southwest of Melbourne and a second southeast, they would end themselves at a distance of a thousand miles or so, the same as a rat in a barrel, and still find themselves as far from their magnetic pole as the north is from the south, the east from the west, or the kingdom of heaven is from the earth. But in the words of another, we would say, to be looking for a South Pole at the end of the 19th century just because some pagan astrologers conceived the idea of a planet Earth, some 2000 years ago and men are yet found who pretend to accept this hidden blasphemy, is presumption in the extreme. The ice barriers which constitute the Earth's circumference, extend for some 30,000 or 32,000 miles but present no opening large enough for the passage of a seal or walrus. No alternation of long days, as in the Arctic region but the months of May, June and July are enshrouded in one long dreary night, the snow never thaws, and the crash of the falling icebergs appalls the stoutest hearts. Therefore, unless any expeditions to these regions is conducted with peculiar caution and intelligence, it would very shortly end in discomfiture and dismay to all concerned. And if anything is attempted beyond the inquiry whether there is any southeast or southwest passage, no possible result can follow than loss and discredit to the promoters and cruel suffering to the parties engaged. Eccentricity of the Suez Paddle Of the size of the sun we have only a few words to say, as we noted the matter in Chapter 14. There is, however, nothing simpler and easier than the practice of plain triangulation, and nothing known to the surveyor more definite in procuring the altitude of any object inaccessible by any cause, such as across rivers, gulfs, the height of towers, steeples, etc. Professor. 
Lewis Swift kindly gave the triangulation of the upper and lower limb edge, which virtually and emphatically gave the diameter, and that not exceeding 25 nautical miles. The Earth, as we have previously proven, is absolutely without motion, either in axial or orbital direction. Both science and scripture, as well as common sense, assert the positive fact of the diurnal revolution of the sun, as well as the rest of the planetary system only, with which the earth has no possible analogy, neither is the latter identified with the former only as a receiver of their benefits for which the creator designed. The sun's speed, in the spring or autumn equinox, is, of necessity, just 15 nautical miles per minute or 900 miles per hour, that being the distance between meridian lines of longitude on the equator, in its lesser orbit, in the June solstice, 150 from the equator. We say 15 degrees from the equator because we have proven in chapter 14, figure 25 that that is correct. North, its speed is proportionately reduced to 665 miles an hour and increased to the same extent in its December or winter solstice to I, 135 miles per The following diagram will more forcibly bring before the redder that peculiar course of our luminary, than we otherwise could. It is the demonstrated facts as to the sun's various positions at the equator, his two tropics and intervening localities, as well as his altitude, that has called forth the facts set forth in the following. As to the exactness of the design or construction of the diagram, we make no claims, yet, we are confident that it properly illustrates the sun's spiral course between the two solstices. In figure 30 let n represent the north center, let the red line represent the June solstice, and the sun at June on the line 45, now trace with a point at the red line until you run into the outer black line, and make one complete revolution and come round the second time, then take the first inner black line, at the junction where it commences to diverge from the outer line, keep your pointer ever on the paper, until you again reach the inner solstice June. Thus you can continue to wind back and forth, or out and in, ever running in the direction of the arrows, the sun's course on his never-ending journey from west to east. For the Creator has declared, that while the sun and the moon shall endure before him, the seed and name of the righteous shall endure. CPS 72, 5, 7, ISA. It may be noticed that there is six black spiral circles and six red, these correspond to the twelve months, and in the sun's course bring the change of seasons. There is a few more interesting points that we will notice in regard to the long continued time regulator that courses his journey through the heavens. Once in 651 years only it is that he crosses every line in his race, and appears on the very minute and second of time, and the minute and second of arc, also, the same day of the month and the same day of the week. It is only at the expiration of that period and that number of journeys through the heavens that he lands on the same identical spot or starts on his journey back from the same. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork in them the heavens, hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to ruin his race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. P.S. 19 colon I to 6. Another worthy point to notice is this, that as the sun travels in his numerical precision of solar time, just 900 miles in one hour on the equator from east to west, so does it travel just 900 miles in 90 days in his spiral course northwards or southwards, there being 90 days from equinox to solstice, the distance is just about 900 miles. Thus it is with all of the Creator's works, they will bear magnifying a thousand times, and yet there will ever be something for his wise creatures to learn. The Solar System In Lockyer's Astronomy, page 78, is an illustration of the Solar System, giving the Sun's disk with Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars and the 13 asteroids 
arranged in two lines in their relative order, and each representing its relative size according to the globular theory. The cut figure 31 will illustrate the diagram. We have only given one half of the disc as he has it in his book, yet we have given all the planets, etc. Their full size as claimed and set forth by him, and the diameter of the sun's disc, all these bearing their relative proportion to the sun day. Now, if we put all these so called mighty bodies in a line and close together, and measure Saturn across his rings, they would only reach a little more than halfway across the sun's disc. We have enlarged the earth to twice its proportions and placed it more than four times the distance that the actual triangulations require. Now, we have placed the sun on the equator, and when in this position it is well known to all people, that on the equator they have just twelve hours sun, and twelve hours absence of sun, the never being over six minutes twilight, but it will be seen that in this case about two thirds of the earth is constantly lit up, therefore, as sixteen is two thirds of twenty four, there should be sixteen hours continuous sun on the equator on the twenty first and twenty two d days of March and September, respectively. This is only one of the thousands of like inconsistencies of building a system, and acknowledging it established, teaching it to our children in our schools, becoming elated and like a soap bubble inflated, until collapsed, and find at last we had only a mythological hypothesis, whose weight and value is as incomprehensible as the cubic contents of the sun, of which Professor Swift's Simple Lessons in Astronomy, page 9, says, 3387000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000000
left its fiery home 48 long years before all the first magnitude stars is equal to 4,484,000 times the Earth's distance from the Sunday simple lesson, p. 88. Now, in order to arrive at the distance of Polaris allowing that to be of the first magnitude, is to multiply 93 million the Sun's distance, by 4,484,000 which equals 417,12,000 miles distance from the Sunday. Yet, the facts are as before given, the North Star subtends the same angle as does the Sun when on the equator to all people at 450 north all around the world. See figure. 24. Professor. Swift says. The four stars forming the bowl of the Great Dipper, Alpha, Beta, Gamma and Delta are on the body of the animal, while the three, Epsilon, Zeta and Etna, which, at the invention of the constellations, may perhaps have occupied some other place in the anatomy of the bear, and rendered the constellation more suggestive of its name than is its present configuration indicative of the animal's long tail, while in truth, the bear is almost destitute of a caudal appendage. This abnormal representation led an old-time pupil to make inquiry why Ursa Major has so long a tail, to which the ancient teacher made reply as follows, Jupiter, fearing to come too nigh unto her teeth, laid hold of her and thereby drew her up unto the heaven, so that she of herself being very weighty, and the distance very great, there was great likelihood that her tail must stretch comma and finished by adding, apostrophe other reasons none I know. If then, the startling fact is conceded that all the stars are in motion, it follows that the time must come, in the far distant future, when every feature of the sidereal heavens as now viewed will be swept away forever. The time is slowly but surely coming, when there will be no dipper in Ursa Major, no chain in Cassiopeia, no sickle in Leo, no belt in Orion, no Southern Cross and during all the eternal ages of the future they will never reappear. In reply to the above statements of Professor Swift, we can only quote a few passages of that word which he has heretofore claimed that he had a calling to teach. Thus, saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day, and the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those depart from before me, saith the Lord, then the seed of Israel also shall cease to be a nation before me forever. Jer. 31 colon 35, 37. But the sons of the Most High shall take the kingdom, and possesses the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Dan. 718. Thus, we leave Professor. Swift in contradistinction with the word of the Creator. Circumnavigation. In figure 33, following, there remains a fair illustration of the circumnavigation of a globe. The captain of a vessel at 45 degree north on the 21st of March, wishing to take his vessel south, and knowing that the sun is vertical on the equator, and wishing his exact bearing, prepares to take observation, at 12 o'clock midday where must he look? Now, all navigators will tell you that his sun will be seen at 450 arc or altitude in the direction of D. Now, if we put the sun five times as far away as what plane geometry demands, he is no better off in getting approximately what he knows he must have, if he knows anything. He well knows his sun must be on the angle C in the direction of D, but lo! His sun is at T, e, and is setting at noonday, for it is on his horizon line. Again, we suppose him sailing on a level sea and at 450 north sea figure.34, halfway between the equator and north center, and his observation is all right. His angle is 450 arc, no trouble here. Now it may be claimed, by the inexperienced, that as before stated, I have deceived by placing the sun to near the earth. Well, if any man can place the sun, or north star or any other object in any other place, on a globe, and yet have an angle of 450 arc from 450 latitude, 
I would give something for the information of how to perform the act. Some who hold the EL Earth to be a globe affirm that they know the Earth to be a globe, because they have sailed around it, and nothing but a globe can be circumnavigated. But we will give another verbal illustration, we take a square block or surface, place a powerful magnet in the center, then tar one, one a stick a few inches long and let this represent a vessel, anywhere on the stick or vessel set a pivot, and on this pivot set a magnetic needle, having done this, travel around this center either way, keeping the stick and the needle at right angles. The effect of this is in every respect a fair illustration of the above eyed off arriving at the same place from whence you set out. Gaining or losing time circumnavigating the earth. This is often referred to as another evidence of the earth's rotundity. But the argument is found wanting when weighed in the balance. By figure 35 we will illustrate this matter. As the sun makes its journey to and from the same place every 24 hours, we will start at the arrow 24 semicolon let the arrow 24 represent a locomotive traveling 15 degrees every 24 hours, while of course the sun travels 300 degrees in the same time 15 degree x 24 equals 360 degree. At precisely 12 o'clock and upon the sun's center O is on the line at 24 and the arrow or locomotive has reached or traveled 15 degrees to figure. I. 5 days more pass, the arrow is at figure. 6 at the same moment that the sun is at 24 noon O. Another 6 days pass and at midnight the locomotive is at 12, the sun at 24 O. Now as we pass this line 12 with the locomotive we drop out a day in order to have the reckoning correspond with sun time, because as we pass the line 12 we have accomplished over half a revolution of the sun, or in other words, while we have been traveling in company with him, we have enjoyed 12 hours more of his light than we would had we stood still. And had we been traveling the other way at the same speed we should have gained the same amount of darkness that we gained light going the other way. Again, it is light that chases darkness around the world, and happy is he who walks in the light. Declination of the polar stars and other objects. Another phenomena supposed to prove rotundity is thought to be the fact that the North Star sinks to the horizon as the traveler approaches the equator or passes, when it beams invisible. This is a conclusion premature and illogical. Were this the fact it is only the ordinary law of perspective for an object to appear lower and lower as it recedes. Stand by the telegraph pole, close by, you have to elevate your head to see the top, at half a mile it appears on a level with your vision, although it be somewhat upgrade. If we look in the times of May 13, 1862, in the naval and military intelligence, we may read as follows, on April 19, in latitude 23053, longitude 35046, Captain Wilkins reports that the Southern Cross and Polar Star were both distinctly visible at midnight. In the event of this being an error of some kind, we may state that we have heard from the lips of Captain Edward Gillick that he has observed the same thing between the 12th and 13th degrees of south latitude. Carpenter's Apostrophe Common Sense Astronomy, p. 47. Inasmuch as the foregoing paragraph has been denied by some, and the affirmation made like the following, it is claimed by navigators that the North Star is observable only when three degrees north of the equator, we prefer always, inasmuch as it is possible, to let our opponents fix their own terms by so doing a reasonable man is better satisfied of his inconsistency, when he condemns himself by his own logic. By referring to figure 33 it will be seen that we have placed the pole star about four times as far from the globe as the actual triangulation requires. From the dark side of the globe and on the equator we have marked off 3 degrees 30, according to the claim of our opponents, from the third degree. Counting north from the equator, we have run a dotted line to A, which is the proper place for the pole star, as it is company equal in altitude and distance with the sun when the latter is on the equator. 
In doing this we have run under a body of earth or seas 666 miles in depth and about 3500 miles long. But with the truth we can be liberal, therefore, we have placed the star at four times the required relative distance from the earth, and there is about 300 miles of earth above the line, which passes through I, 500 miles of earth. Again, we arise from the earth to a distance of 6 degrees of the circle to the dotted line, J. Now, 6 times 60 for their miles, equal 360 miles high above the earth in order to see the North Star if the Earth were a globe. Refraction of the Atmosphere Inasmuch as there exists in the minds of some a great amount of incredulity, lest we have not made due allowance for refraction, it may not be out of place to say a few words, also to give, so far as known, the existing laws which govern conditions and existing contingencies, by which it is possible to make any allowance. We will first give the views of a scientific source, and their tables for the same, that every man can choose for himself. The Encyclopaedia Britannica, article on leveling, says, we suppose the visual ray to be a straight line, whereas, on account of the unequal densities of the air at different distances from the earth, the rays of light are incubated by refraction. The effect of this is to lessen the difference between the true and apparent levels, but in such an extremely variable and uncertain manner that if any constant or fixed allowance is made for dotted in formula or tables it will often lead to a greater error than what it was intended to obviate. For, though the refraction may at a mean compensate for about one-seventh of the curvature of the earth, it sometimes exceeds one-fifth and at other times does not amount to one-fifteenth. We have, therefore, made no allowance for refraction in formula. By the above we see that the Britannica did not consider it necessary to make allowance for refraction, yet, whilst some others who may be considered authority have done so, we will give such as we have, but will say that refraction can only exist when the visual line of sight passes from one medium into or through another of different density, and it is usually or perhaps I may say always, for such has been my experience, when the beholder is standing in a more rarefied atmosphere than that into or through which he is beholding. Such are the conditions of a mirage or refraction, though the mirage of an object is usually inverted. The amount of refraction allowed by ordnance surveyors is one twelfth of the altitude of the object observed at the horizon. Now, it is a well known fact that our horizon distance, while there are various tables giving such, is not always the same to the same eye, inasmuch as the conditions of the atmosphere govern, to a more or less extent. In March, 1888, the writer visited a point of the and known as Sturgeon Point. Its promontory extends into Lake Erie, and is 18 miles, direct line across the bay, from the city of Buffalo, New York. The sun was shining bright, the ice which lay in the bay and harbour was fast thawing, and a perceptive vaporish atmosphere arising between the point where I was located and the city. Over the city rested a heavy cloud of smoke, mingled with the steam of many passing locomotives, which are in constant transit around the city. With our telescope we could locate many of the prominent buildings, such as the transportation warehouses, elevators, etc. But with the unaided eye, we could at intervals, when the steam of passing trains lightened the smoke over the city, behold all that portion of the city lying along the harbour inverted in the atmosphere. Sometimes the inverted mirage would rest on the roofs and pinnacles, or the tops of their substances, and then again they would rise as the smoke and steam would rise from the city. As the wind would gently move the aqueous substance, so would the panoramic scenery change. The most beautiful of all this scenery was this, at about two miles or more north of the described view and the city proper, stands the International Bridge, between the Canadian and American shores, across the Niagara River. While this lay behind a point of land on the Canada side and our position, we could distinctly observe the mirage of the bridge, with its beams, piers, braces, etc. And an inverted train of cars in transit 
all suspended in the atmosphere above. On the preceding page we present a table showing difference of apparent and true level, or the supposed curvature of the earth with and without refraction, further illustration is given in diagram, figure. 36. Navigation. Distance and dip of Hirazok. Example 3. A steamer is seen e semicolon the horizon zine in the masts is assumed to be 16 feet above the level e backslash required the distance t, the ship. Height of the light 100 feet equals 13.23 miles a b. The assumed height 1 g feet equals 5.29 miles e b. Distance to ship 7.94 miles e. The last table for curvature and refraction, together with distance and dip of horizon, and the examples I, 2 and 3 are facsimiles of what may be found in an English standard work, 12th edition, by John W. Nistrom, Philadelphia, entitled, Mechanics and Engineering. On the above we have a few remarks. First, we have published the table of curvature for the benefit of those who believe that there is an existing curvature or convexity to water, or in other words, that this earth is a globe 25,000 miles in circumference. Second, we have published the same for the benefit of those who know better as well as for those who wish to investigate, and third, we wish all to know the fraud that is practiced upon the credulity of the unsuspecting community and the rising generation in the public schools. Such illustrations and fraudulent misrepresentations have become by far too prevalent in our public schools. First, we notice by placing a protractor on the illustration, that the entire length of the scale is 65 degree of the arc of a complete circle. Now, 65 degree at 60 miles each 3600 miles. From the water to top of lighthouse is 5 degree equals equals 300 miles high. From the water to the top mast of the most distant ship 300 miles. From the lighthouse to the farther ship is 37 degree which equals 2220 miles, on the globe hypothesis, or any other theory or fact, where proportion is used. In conclusion, we only have to say, that the only thing in, the diagram or scale that even approximates to the truth, is the examples and they are based on a hypothesis, which is only a supposition and can be of no practical value whatever further than the exercise of mathematics. For the benefit of schools, etc. We give English miles corresponding with nautical and geographical miles. Figure. 37 gives the relative difference between English and nautical, or geographical miles. The first line of divisions, in figure 37, it will be seen runs from my to 208 miles. Of these there are 69 and 16 to 100 to each degree of longitude on the equator, as represented on the lower edge of figure 37. It will be further noticed that 208 English miles are equal to 180 nautical, c, or geo, graphical miles. In figure 38 we have first, as will be seen by laying a straight edge across the two scales, figs. 37 and 38, on the lower edge of figure. 38, 13, 30, 45 and 60 seconds, or 1 minute sun time. 15 solar, which equals 15 nautical miles or 17 English miles. Thus, both sun and solar measurements of time and distance can be computed to any extent by the simplest rules of arithmetic. Comparison of longitude and time. Since the sun makes his revolution through the heavens and above the earth in 24 hours, from east to west, or through 360 degree of longitude, it follows that in one hour he passes 1 24th of 360 degree, or 150, in one minute of time through 1 60th of 15 degree, or 15 arc, and in one second of time through 1 60th of 15 arc, which is equal to 15, arc. Comparison, for a difference of
The English land or statute mile is 5,280 feet. The nautical, sea, or solar mile is 6,075 feet. A new circular map of the world, and longitude and time calculator. We have prepared a new map of the world as it is. The map is finely executed and printed in six colors. It contains all the continents and principal islands and rivers of the world, also, all the principal cities of the earth. The circle of the map is 14 and 1 fourth inches, having a time dial on which is marked in bold Roman numerals the 24 hours of the day and the minutes of the hour. The face of the map is provided with two detached radiating arms from the center to the circumference of the time dial. The arms are held together by friction having a pivot socket at the center of the map. On the arms is stamped the degrees of latitude, by the operation or moving of these arms the relative time of day or night is quickly determined and read on the dial by the child or person who can read the multiplication table, or tell the time of day by the hands of a clock. Latitude and longitude, and the existing difference of time between any places may be determined without the aid of figure sign a moment's time after the places have been located on the map. The great advantages to the child or pupil are these, the whole world is before the person, with all its continents, countries, etc. In their detail and relative location, the one to the other, and so is the geography of the earth and seas established in the mind. The map should hang in the house of every family in the land as well as every office or public place. The publishing company have ready a large wall map for school rooms and public places. The company will not only supply the United States, but the world, and very soon the globe map and Mercator's projection will not be found. As a useful commodity they will not exist, and if any existence of them should be preserved it would be but a memorial of that pagan idolatry from which the nations had evolved. The hypothesis of the motions of the earth and planets around the sun were not original with even Copernicus, as has been claimed or supposed by some. According to mythological tradition, Pythagoras, the sun worshipper, was the medium through which the devil operated, to bring into requisition the present godless adorations of the inventions of man, godless, I say, for such ideas as the founders of the system possessed and taught, I am safe in saying, never sprang from a divine source. It is but simply a matter of justice that I mention the source of this pagan institution. In the opinion of Pythagoras, God is the universal spirit, diffused in all directions from the center, the soic of all animal life, the actual inward cause of all motion. To the divinity there were subordinate three kinds of intelligences, gods, demons and heroes, emanations of the supreme, varying in perfection and dignity, in proportion as they were more or less removed from their source. The heroes he believed to be clothed with a body of subtle matter. Besides these three kinds, there was a fourth, the human mind. The regions of the air, the Pythagoreans thought, were filled with spirits, demons and heroes, who were the cause of sickness or health to men or animals, and by means of dreams and other kinds of divinations, imparted the knowledge of future events. Of man they believed that since he consisted of an plementary nature, a divine or rational principle, he was a microcosm, that his soul was a self-moving principle and consisted of two parts, the rational, which was a portion of the universal soul an emanation of the central fire, and had its seat in the brain, the irrational comprising the passions, which had its seat in the heart, that in both, man had something in common with the brutes. Pythagoras taught that he who devotes himself to this study is a philosopher. For this purpose it is necessary to invoke in prayer the assistance of the divinity and good demons. For the facts see Pythagoras in any encyclopedia perspective laws and vanishing points. It is a well-known and universally accepted theory, with astronomers and scientists, that any round body, whether celestial or terrestrial, vanishes or disappears visually at a distance from the beholder of 3,000 times its diameter. In this case, 
as in every other, we will only use their own words and illustrations in order to vanish their paganistical and idolatrous theory. Truths, though a thousand, hold good together. Falsehoods, no matter how many, no, never. One first, we give the statement of Dr. A. Wilford Hall. In his journal The Arena, of September, 1887, he says, any round body, whatever its size, will be reduced to its perspective point in receding 3000 times its own diameter from us. In order to speak from demonstrated knowledge in the matter, we made three small targets as follows, one, one half inch, and pinned it on a board of dark background, secondly, two more of the same size as the first. These last two we placed their edges together as shown in figure. 39. Tacking these up some three feet from the first, we prepared the third complete circle, one inch in diameter, and fastened the latter about the same distance from the second as was the previous two apart. Now, as 3,000 half inches equal 125 feet, we measured the distance with a 10 foot pole, and FLG 39 found that with some difficulty we could just discern the first target. The second target, of two half inch circles together, were easily distinguished at about 260 feet, while the inch circle was discernible about 800 feet. So we see that it is the increase of area that has more to do with the vanishing distance than has the increase of diameter in a round substance, as we have shown. The half inch circle contains 1963 area, while the inch contains 7854 area, nearly four times as much area as the half inch, and seen nearly four times as far. Theory is good, yes, excellent, when founded on correct principles, otherwise it is equal to feeding the horse sawdust for meal. But we will look into this law of perspective a little farther. In both Lockyer's and R. A. Proctor's elements of astronomy is a representation of Jupiter and his four moons, sizes, distances, etc. And Mr. Proctor says they have been seen without the aid of a telescope. The following, figure 40, is an illustration of the same. Inasmuch as these men are representative men, and publishers of dot standard works, not a few for our schools, etc. The barefaced imposition upon the unsuspecting pupils is too manifest and too tempting to the investigator to let pass. Were these statements and pretentious measurements made by a novice we could let them pass. The error demands exposure, though the men are dead and gone. If we turn to page 296 in Lockyer's Elements of Astronomy, Appendix Table QF Distance from the Earth, etc. We will find marked Jupiter's least distance from Earth, 408,709,000 miles from the Earth. Now, the diameter is given at about 85,000 miles, 3,000 times this equals 255 million miles as the vanishing point of Jupiter. This, then, requires, according to these men's own words and figures, that Jupiter be placed 153,709,000 miles further than they claim it to be. So we see again that two errors, though confirmed by two great authors and believed by all the world, do not make one truth, nor come within a million miles of an approximatio to the truth. As the distance of Jupiter's satellites from their primary are given in figure 40, their diameters are given as follows. O, oh, 2,252 miles, Europa, 2,099 miles, Ganymede, 3,436 miles, Kersto, 3,057. We will give another sample, take Kersto's diameter, 3,057 times 3,000 equals 9,171,000 miles, add this latter to Jupiter's least distance from the Earth which Mr. Lockyer gives as being 408,709,000 miles, and we have the little satellite removed from the Earth, 
470,870,880,000 miles from the Earth 470,880,000, and yet Mr. R. A. Proctor says they Jupiter's moons, have been seen without the aid of the telescope. I can say that I have seen of Jupiter's satellites with a small field glass of not more than six or eight powers, and I can further say that plane triangulation proves all of those theories, in regard to distance and dimensions, millions of miles in excess of facts. But, say some, should we not be charitable to our opponents and believe that it is the area of the body instead of the diameter that demands 3000 times its surface for its vanishing distance? Yes, I think so, this is what our first and only experiment proved to be, approximately, the truth, but most bodies contain more area than diameter, therefore, it would not help their side of the question. The sun's disk, for instance, with all his system is on less than one half its area. I know oh one no round body whose diameter is greater in an its circumference, unless it be that animal's body anciently spoken of, which it was said was possible to go through the eye of a needle. There is known to exist the diameter of a circle whose circumference is equal and no more than equal to itself. Four inches in round numbers is the maximum, it stands in the decimals thus, 4 inch circumference, 12 to 566, 4 inch area, 12 to 5664. Below 4 inches, circumference exceeds area, above 4 inches, area exceeds circumference. Thus, for instance, 3 inches diameter contains 9 to 4248 in circumference while the same contains 7 to 0686 area. The other side of 4 to 5 the circumference is 15 to 708, the area of the same is 19 to 6350, but no maximum is known for the co-equal of diameter and area. Transits and Eclipses versus Orbit of the as we have desired to notice the oft-repeated assertions in regard to the shadows of the earth on the moon the earth between the sun and the moon is the equivalent, we will try and make the matter plain in this article. Mr. R. E. L. Love, of Vadis, W. Var. Kindly sent us an article which he wrote for a tennis paper, The Busy South. Such portions as bear on the subject and are not a repetition of what I have written, I gladly publish and illustrate by a diagram further on in the subject. First, just now, the papers are giving lengthy articles from astronomers, whose fertile imaginations are constantly evolving some new theoretical speculation. They are now talking of men and their doings, who, they claim, inhabit the planet Mars, that red star, so discernible at times, in the sky. Early in August of this year it was given out by American astronomers that they had discovered on the southwestern limb of Mars, three bright lights, forming a triangle, which would flash up brilliantly for a time, and then suddenly disappear. In the official report from the Lick Observatory, Monday night, August the 8th, it was stated, apostrophe last night on the South Polar Cap very complex and numerous dark markings were visible. The unique spectacle of markings in the snow caps has been noted not only with the large telescope, but with the 12 inch by Barnard, who some time ago observed that on one night a dark streak would appear across the polar cap, and then would follow a separation, and then the disappearance of a large portion of the polar cap, leaving to white spots. The great Milan astronomer, Professor. Chaparelli, has also discovered numerous and extensive canals cut in Mars, he claims. The New York world of August the Ith, whose correspondent had interviewed the professor, says, for Chaparelli was the first person to give definite basis upon which to rest the belief that Mars was inhabitable by a highly civilized race. He discovered that the surface of the planet was intersected by a large number of canals. It was apparent from the map he drew, that these streaks were real canals because they were perfectly straight, were obviously artificial because they did not recur on any of the other stars.
it took all of Cipirelli's sheen eyesight to detect their two parallel banks. What a pity! Now, if the professor had only used a portion of his eyesight to discover the people who cut those ditches, he would have had a stronger story. We read further in the paper mentioned, that the astronomers not only believe that the lights, lines, etc. are an arrangement to signal us on the earth, and that they are also trying to think of some means to answer them, but that apparently these black streaks which move so mysteriously, yet with a seeming method, over the frozen pole are plainly concentrate at the pole itself. This would be natural under the circumstances, as if great ropes or blankets of some dark substance had been tied or anchored at the poles, and were being swung from their lower ends slash how very ingenious. Ropes, blankets, flashlights, canals and their banks, clearly outlined. Astronomers who talk of seeing those things as though but a few paces off, would certainly be in possession of keen eyesight, when we know that they place the distance of Mars from the Earth at 35 million miles. But what about the people they might have seen, also? Well, when it comes to such speculations as they indulge in, they need not despair about the people for they can be exactly located in some way. Let us see, we once heard a gentleman say that at regular intervals of a certain number of years, that where there are mines or large deposits of precious metal, such as silver ore, it would throw off a gas, which, coming in contact with phosph becomes ignited, giving a very brilliant light. Then, since astronomers have declared that they have found iron, sodium, salt, etc. in the sun, why not Mars be a vast ball, say of gold, this would help them to account for its bright appearance, different from any other star. The burning of the gas will prove the metal, and account for the jack-o'-lantern lights they have seen. The ditches they have mistaken for canals show where the people have been getting out, or rather, taking in, the precious metal, for, since the men are not seen on the outside, it is evident that they live on the inside. As authority also for this, we have but to call up the great novelist, Lord Bulwer Lytton, who has predicted a mighty people in the bowels of the earth, in his book called Apostrophe the Coming Race. So, having them once located there, the moving of the southern cap, which from its color was thought to be snow, is only a trapdoor made of refined metal. The spots which its moving exposes, are the furnaces and fires of the refiners. Now the idea would be, not to make known to them that they have been discovered, but to make a rush upon them and capture their treasure. Jules Verne, the famous Frenchman, who is the author of A Trip to the Moon, can readily concoct a scheme for the astronomers to get there and bring the gold away. So much for speculative astronomy. And tis just as rational as the Newtonian theory of creation which says that the universe was once filled with flying particles, which gradually collected into atoms of matter, and these, through countless ages of time formed themselves into nebulous masses, which, after other ages, and as it were, by self-obtained rotation, became leery suns, that many of these suns, after other countless ages, passed into what they term the planetary state, and became inhabitable and that in this way the earth became what it now is. This is the text and basis of the popular and idolized system of modern astronomy. How the particle first came into existence, and why it did not continue to grow, are questions which of course astronomers are not to be required to answer. Tell us the dream and we will tell the interpretation. Apostrophe well, let those who will, serve Baal but let us follow truth. God tells us, in language unmistakable, how he created the earth, and the orbs of light for its use. Apostrophe in the beginning etc. Apostrophe, that is, when time commenced. God is a creature of eternity, and eternity knows no time. Time was instituted five days before man, for man, because he was made a creature of time. At the beginning of that first day, which was a day of twenty-four hours, as will be easily proven, God by his own 
almighty volition brought the world into existence out of a commingled mass of water, earth, etc. For we read that it was without form and void. And it was not till the beginning of the third day that the complete separation of earth and water was brought about, and the dry land appeared, and not till the end of the same day that the planets were created to give light, signs and seasons for the earth. In short, they are the great clock of time, and are performing their work perfectly, as we will notice. Hence, you see we had an earth before we had a sun or planet in the heavens, notwithstanding the Newtonian theory to the contrary. While it might take ages for the waves of the sea to toss up the sands of a continent, yet, who would deny that by the power of the Creator the earth was not brought forth in a moment? For he spake and it was done, he commanded and it stood fast. So while geologists may figure on the slow process of evolution and germination, there was an almighty power in the universe which did bring about suddenly those things we behold. That power was God, and it would be just as reasonable to argue that the loaves with which Christ fed the five thousand had undergone the natural process of baking, as to rob God of his declared creation by belief in the Newtonian, geological theory, however popular it may be. It may not be generally known that the astronomers have not been able to reconcile the different motions of the planets to completely harmonize with their orbital theory, but such is the case. Since Mars is a favorable subject just now, we will briefly take it for illustration. In figure 41 let s represent the sun day. The first circle from the sun will represent the earth's orbit with the earth in position at e. The outer circle will represent the orbit of Mars, at m July 29, 1891, 8 months later, March 29, 1892, and 4 months later still, August 3 d, 1892, see at opposition. Hence we see the Earth is stationary. Mars swings, to and from far beyond the sun while moving in course with the other planets in her daily circuits around over the earth, her points being indicated by the rise and fall from horizon to zenith and the position of the sun day. Mars, like other celestial bodies, is filling an important place in the cycles of time as marked by the heavenly bodies. The comets, too, play an important part but their strangely elongated orbits are an everlasting contradiction to the Newtonian theory of gravitation. This is a fact confessed by every astronomer of any note. Eclipses of the moon are caused by certain non-luminous bodies of the heavens passing between the earth and the moon, recurring continually, at regular intervals of about 18 years and 11 days. That there are non-luminous bodies so circulating is admitted by Herschel in his astronomy, p. 521. There are also many other authorities. There are 70 different eclipses that repeat themselves every 18 years and a fraction. This cycle of years, with their fraction continually repeated, makes up another cycle, which is an even one every 651 years. Thus, eclipses being but repetitions, their calculation is brought to a simplicity. Mr. J. B. Dimbleby, professor of chronology and member of the British Astronomical Society, in his work called All Past Time, has traced every eclipse back to the creation of the world and verified the fact that the Bible is the most accurate and scientific book that has ever been written. If a single day or date had been incorrectly given therein the error would at once be discovered. It also shows that the lunar year of 354 days, in which the biblical chronology is given, was just the same length without a variation at the date of the flood. Mr. Dimbleby says, the first eclipse of the sun took place during the nights of Friday and Saturday of the first and to D of the fourth month in the first year of the world, or the year OA. M. Which synchronizes consecutively with Friday and Saturday, January 8th and 12th, in each of the consecutive periods of 651 years. In 1861 a. d. the date was the first day of 5860 astronomical, by counting the first 12 months as year i instead of year o. 
the reader will only have to turn to the tables in the first part of this book to find the tables of Mr. Dimbleby referred to. No matter what the motion of the planets, or where in their orbits, the opposition may occur, for they do not always recur at the same season of the year, it will be seen that Mars ought always be seen one half her time p in her half orbit representing her opposition, and the other half of her time on the side of her conjunction. But it has never occurred. Now we will take the same eclipse of January, 1861 and give an illustration of the application of the cycle of 18 years and 11 days, of course there are a few odd minutes also, which, carried out fully, would account for the eclipse not occurring in the same latitude always, but this will be sufficient for the purpose. Eclipse 1861 to I, N. Add 18 years. Oh, 11 days. Result. 1879 to I, 22. Thus, the eclipse of the NTH of January, 1861, should reoccur January 20 to D, 1879. Now consult your almanac for that year and you will find it so given. Notable instances of the eclipses of the moon mentioned by astronomers being seen when both the sun and moon were wholly visible above the horizon, and when the earth could not have been between the sun and moon, were observed July 17, 1590, November 2, 1648, June 16, 1666, May 26, 1868, July 19, 1750, and April 20, 1838. They attempt to explain this phenomenon by atmospheric refraction. This is deceiving, as we will clearly demonstrate. We quote from Quackenbos, or you may consult any other standard work on the subject if you please. Refraction is the change of direction which a ray of light experiences on passing obliquely from a rare medium to apostrophe another. Rays from the heavenly bodies on entering our atmosphere obliquely from a rare medium are refracted. Let a ray pass from air a rare medium, into water a denser medium, and it is refracted. Quackenbo's Natural Philosophy, p. 246247. Hence, as the two conditions are parallel they must follow the same principle and be bent in the same direction. Now, j in what direction are rays in air and water refraction turned? That weight may not be questioned we will again quote from page 247, something, too, which all may prove. Place a coin on the bottom of an empty vessel, and fix the eye in such a position that it just misses seeing it on account of the vessel's side coming between. Keep the either and let water be poured in, the coin will then become visible. Thus, the line from my to coin falling over the rim of the vessel is turned downward through the water in the direction of your feet. Thus, the light from the sun passing into our atmosphere should, if the earth were a globe, pass over the curve of the earth downward and bring the shadow sooner to a point. This also destroys the idea, created by astronomers, of the earth's shadow being increased from 8,000 miles to 59,000 miles in diameter when it reaches the moon. In order to partially explain the eclipse, sometimes of about five hours duration. But this, even, would not avail them, for with an axial motion of the Earth of I, o, o, o miles an hour, together with an orbital speed of 19 miles a second, the Moon would quickly sail clear again. If the Earth were a globe the North Star should disappear below the northern horizon as you pass beached the equator but it has been seen from near the latitude of the Tropic of Carpe Gorn. To account for this fact astronomers rush in again with refraction turned the other way. Poor foolish men! Cannot they see that this destroys all their work they had wrought out for the moon? When the gun is shooting the one ball two ways at the same time, it cannot be said to center in the target for which it is aimed directly ahead. Better that they renounce it at once for that is coming to pass of which Dr. Woodhouse, Professor of Astronomy, Cambridge, about 1840 wrote, If our premises be disputed and our facts challenged, the whole range of astronomy does not contain the proofs of its own accuracy. 
and must fall to the ground. Wherever we look we see the followers of the sun worshipper, Pythagoras, plunged into a sea of difficulties on every hand. What must we conclude truly the geologist's creation is not God's creation, neither is Newton's laws God's laws. Apostrophe. The earth is a plain, for he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. P.S. Colon 24 colon 2. We have shown you the time from creation, and in such a way that it forever overthrows every speculative theory, silences the idea of prehistoric animal creation, shows the purposes of the planets in being made subservient to the earth, and therefore, not habitable material worlds. We will close this chapter, as we begun it, with some appropriate scripture, there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. I call. 15, 16. The heavens, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. P.S. 115 colon 16. The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken, lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what wisdom is in them. Apostrophe Jerem. 8 colon 9. R. E. L. Lub. A solar eclipse is the result simply of the moon passing between the sun and the observer on the earth. But that an eclipse arises from a shadow of the earth is a statement in every respect, because unproved and unsatisfactory. The earth has been proved to be a plane, always underneath the sun and moon, and, therefore, to speak of its intercepting the light of the sun, and thus casting its own shadow on the moon, is to say, what is, according to natural laws, impossible. The Fivers Nile, the Mazu and Mississippi. Another striking absurdity to the globular theory is the course of the river Nile, whose mouth is 2,000 miles higher than its starting point. The river starts on the equator at Lake Victoria and runs 2,000 miles due north and empties into the Mediterranean Sea. The supposed incline of the earth would in fact require the river to lean or incline back from its bed. By looking at any map of Africa I will see that this river is over 2,000 miles high, vertical and standing on its small end at that. There are thirty more rivers in Asia running into the Arctic Ocean. Surely, this globular world was a great invention. At about twelve degrees below the equator, the tributaries of the river Congo and the Nile commence their northward course and terminate at Alexandria in Egypt, thirty degrees north of the equator. We go west of the source of this mighty river about 750 of longitude and we find 30 tributaries of sufficient note to be laid down on a 6 inch globe mat, and many of these rivers bringing their waters from over 1000 miles south of the equator and depositing into the Amazon, whose mouth is on the equator. All of this the globe theorists think to account for by the laws of gravitation. But we will go a little farther north before we return. Go into Asia and we can again count 30 rivers flowing into the Arctic Ocean. Now return to the mouth of the Nile, which is 30 de, gras north latitude, from thence 120 degree of longitude west, on the same line of latitude, to the mouth of the Mississippi. This last, but second longest river in the world has brought its waters from 50 degree north and deposited on the same line of longitude of the Nile. How is this for gravitation? Degrees of longitude, south versus north, the equator. A challenge considered. He proposed in this chapter to notice the propositions and challenges that we have had from numerous sources to prove the Earth a plane, in view of alleged and supposed facts, that the degrees of longitude south of the equator converged into one common center at 90 degrees south. The above requirements are but just and logical, so far as supposition or hypothesis is concerned. In order to show that the challenges are not imaginary, we will just give a few extracts from one who has claimed to entertain his team for us, only with the exceptional consideration of our heretical views in regard to the earth a plane. 
For these, however, we expect collocation by many of our friends. As a considerative I will first give the extracts, and consider them the propositions which we will adhere to. New York, August 11, 1891 Alex. Gleason, Buffalo, N. Y. Dear brother, I have been thinking about you a good deal since I saw you at Fulton, and wondering how you were feeling over the flat earth by this time. The ID thought I should ever believe that this earth was flat instead of round as the creator formed it, or that anybody should ever gather the idea from anything that I have said, that I believed any such nonsense, is, beyond all question, supremely foolish. I never did believe it, and the more I study it and understand the true philosophy of the earth, its form, motion, etc. The more firmly I am convinced that my early education was accurate in that regard, and the more real, pure and unadulterated nonsense I see in the fallacious arguments and would-be points made by the Zetetic astronomers. I a, unless you can show me a diagram of prisoning the flat earth, lighted up by the sun in some way that three-fourths percent of anyone of the parallels of latitude south of the equator is covered at the same time, be and until you can show me a government map, made by men of education and learning, in which the meridians of longitude diverge to the south, south of the equator, see, and until you can prove that it takes ships longer to pass over a degree of longitude south of the equator than it does to pass over a degree in the corresponding latitude north of the equator, d and until you can explain clearly, logically and philosophically how there can be actual night and day from pole to pole at one and the same time, E, and until you can make a telescope that will bring a ship back to view after it has disappeared over the water in clear weather, and a host of other propositions as unanswerable according to the flat earth theory, please do not state to anyone that bro. of New York City, leans toward the flat earth. Theory. How could I believe it when I see so much in it contrary to the natural laws of philosophy, astronomy? and everyday experience of thousands of men who sail the seas. Slash. Gee, I hope our little interview at Fulton has had the effect to put a new idea at least in your mind. B I ask you as an honest man, as I believe you are, to drop the investigation of the flat earth theory with which you find so many common philosophical propositions hard to harmonize, and for a short time concede the fact that the earth is round and then see how many philosophical problems will need to be explained to harmonize with it. Just consider it, I say, for a short time, and see if all these matters do not harmonize perfectly with science both philosophical and astronomical, and also with the experience of men who navigate the seas, especially those south of the equator. Slash. I believe, Brother Gleason, that this theory is K a child of the dark ages, in fact, I am quite sure it is, for going beyond the Christian era we find the first man who predicted an eclipse was called Thales, who lived 600 years b. c. Slash, I say he was the first man to predict an eclipse which came to pass at the appointed time, and this man Thales, believed in and taught the sphericity of the earth but later on when we come to the 13th century is where we have strong historical testimony that they believed the earth to be flat. M, when Columbus conceived the idea that the earth was round they mocked him and laughed him to scorn for thinking so. Notice also Galileo in the same. I believe in my heart it is from the enemy who is trying in every way to deceive us, to prejudice minds against the truth and influence the servants of God. If I had not met you and talked with you, so that you know who I am and I know who you are, I would not thus take interest in writing you. I want to see bro. Gleason be himself again, as he was before this idea reached him. If you have time and it is convenient for you to write me a few lines I shall be very much pleased to hear from you. Yours very truly. We do not offer a public reply to this kindly disposed letter because of any feelings of retaliation, but because, first, we believe there is not one demonstrated fact existing that cannot be demonstrably explained on the principle of the earth a plane, if the fact is a relative one, 
and explainable on any known principle. At the writing of my friend's pertinent letter I did not have some of the demonstrated facts from just the standpoint from which he, with others, demanded, therefore, I have carefully retained his good letter, though I did not cease my investigations according to his impetuosity, together with many other earnest solicitations and sarcastic denunciations. The truth has not yet spoiled, and we have it fresh and beautifully harmonious today, and as we now think that this illustration will be our last one by diagram for this book, though by far not minor in importance, we kindly ask the reader to follow us through carefully and patiently, noticing the evidence from that source required by our opponents, or those, who like ourselves, have demanded proof and nothing conceded. As we have lettered the points in our friend's letter, we will notice them in order. For the first designated as A, we will refer the reader to chapter 15 of this book, diagrams 26, 27, 28, and as he, with others, require some government or official authority, we give Professor J. Morrison, of the Bureau of Navigation and Navy Department, Washington, D. C and the Encyclopaedia Britannica and the Navigator's Records of South Sea Voyages, etc. By Sir James Ross. The corresponding nights and days in South Sea latitudes, of which he referred to, will be found in the same chapter, this also covers requirement B. A few of our most radical friends have made the following very fair proposal and concession, namely, if it can be shown that the degrees of longitude are less in Australia or anywhere south of the equator than upon it, there can be no question but that the earth is a globe in form, and if it can be shown by actual measurement that these degrees of longitude lengthen or diverge from each other as we go south from the equator, it must, with equal force and reason, be admitted that orthodox geography is untrue, and the supposed configuration of the earth a myth. We are now ready to offer our final evidence for the consideration of all parties. Following is the coast tracing of the west coast of South Africa, also east and coast of South America, each bearing its relative position to each other in both latitude and longitude, and relative positions on the equator. We style the illustration figure. 42. We will further state that this tracing is from a small size globe map which we preferred for convenience, but it will be found to agree very closely, so far as relative coastlines, latitude, longitude and distances are concerned, with the best maps known. We have made a scale of degrees of longitude from Washington as to the meridian of 105 degree on the continent of Africa. Now, if we take the extreme distance on the equator between Africa and South America, we find it to be 56 degree of longitude, and these equal 3360 miles from a tour on the scale, but if we allow the globe theorists all they claim for curvature, it would be about 60 miles more, and thus it stands on the scale, 3420 miles. Now, if we measure the distance between Cape of Good Hope in the scale and Cape Horn, we will find that two distances to very closely agree. Now, if one inch represents 1000 miles on the equator, on water, it certainly represents 1000 miles in every other place on the same globe scale. We next take the distance from Cape of Good Hope to Buenos Aires, which is 60 degree or 3600 miles according to the same scale or any other globe scale in the land made by scientific and educated men. So much for authentic theory, and we will next see what the authentic, practical, and experienced navigator says in regard to these distances and the very shortest time ever made between these places by the best class of steamships, built by the best builders that Europe affords, and at the expense of the East India government. In order to procure these facts it has taken considerable time, and no expense has deterred us from securing facts which is now a great relief and pleasure to give to the world. We trust the reader will bear patiently with us while we give the demonstrated facts in the case. About the middle of November, 1891, I put the following notice in the New York World. 
wanted, the address of an unlimited number of navigators or seafaring persons who have made the voyage or voyages between the following places, and can give the distances in knots, and approximate time in days, of making the several voyages, number, I, Cape Town, Africa, to Buenos Aires or Montevideo. Number, 2, Cape Town, Africa, to Cape Horn, etc. Others of which we will not take time to mention, of which we have time, measurements, etc. From the most experienced, or he who furnished the best references, we selected the information, no one knowing for what purpose we wanted the desired knowledge, or anything in regard to our views. The following became my informant in regard to the desired information. 53 Woodward Avenue, South Newark, CT. November 23, 1891. J. Alex. Gleason, Esk. Dear Sir, Seeing the enclosed which he cut from the paper advertisement, I wish to say that I can give you the required information, having served in the Cape Horn, west coast of South America, and Australian trade for several years, as second officer of steamer Lochinva, Abbey Town and Palgrave. Awaiting further information concerning your terms, believe me respectfully yours. Charles By Brown Reply to my second letter. Dear Sir, in reply to your letter received today, I wish to state to you how far I can meet your requirements. First, to satisfy you that I am what I claim to be, and qualified to give you all the information required, the number of my certificate is 014358, licensed on June 4, 1884, in London, England, by the Lords of Privy Council for Trade. Second, Certificates of Discharge, Number I, Four Mast Steamship Palgrave, Number 2. Steamship Compter, Number 3. Ship Huron, Put Back Disabled, Number 4. Transferred to Abbey Town, Bound to South America and N. S. W. and Chilix South America. Served on this voyage from October 6, 1886 to October 7, 1887. This is the date of my last official discharge. The above certificates are now in my possession. From charts used during my service in the ships named, I can give you all the information required, but cannot from ship's logbook at the same time, I can and will gladly give you all the information you want from my charts. Thanking you for enclosed, believe me, yours respectfully, Charles B. Brown. P. S. I have also letters for service and ability, signed by Captains Dunn, Dulles, Thomas and Andres, and Chief Officer Adams. C. B. B. Third letter, December 10, 1891. Alex. Gleason, Esk. Dear Sir. The courses and distances are all taken from charts used in steamships Lochinva, Abbey Town, Compter and Palgrave. I would state that the distances are in all cases worked to geographical or nautical miles, 60 of which are equal to 69 and one fourth English miles. You are, no doubt, aware that there is 6,070 feet to the nautical mile. This is often the cause of dispute with regard to the distance from port to port, many people not being aware of the difference between a nautical and statute mile. Distances, course and time are as follows. First, Cape Town to B. Airs, course, west by 6 degrees south, distance, 4560 miles. Best time record known, steamship Lochinver, Captain. Shelley, 13 days, 13 hours, 45 minutes. Second, Cape Town to Cape Horn semicolon course, west by 240 south, distance comma 5700 miles. Best time in record, Abbey Town, Captain. Dulles, 13 days and 23 hours. Yours respectfully.
Charles B. Brown. It would be useless to weary the patient reader with all the details of voyages, distance and time that this navigator has given to Auckland, N. Z. Sydney, Australia, etc. But it is well worthwhile to now consider the above carefully. First, if we take any globe map of the world and measure the distance from the Cape of Good Hope to Buenos Aires, we will find it from 180 to 200 miles further than it is from Cape of Good Hope to Cape Horn. Bear this in mind. The navigator says that from Cape Good Hope to Cape Horn is 5,700 miles, and he gives the course. This would throw Cape of Good Hope, South Africa, back to B and South America back to C, and make that distance, which theory shows to be the least by about 200 miles, the greatest by I, 140 miles. Second, we will notice that Aotearoa is represented a pinhead on the equator and on the coastlines of the two continents, this would hold the two coastlines in position on the equator, which is an undisputed point. But if we take these continents and open their southern points to B, C, it will give the degrees of longitude that divergency required on the principle of the Earth a plane, and Captain Brown would be all right with his Mercator charts. But what has become of our New York friends' requirements in regard to the degrees of longitude? This we will see further on as we examine the ship's time record. To the above fact I wrote Captain Brown, calling his attention to this discrepancy of distance, and after waiting until a reply was passed due, I wrote a second letter, stating that perhaps there was some mistake in the figures, thinking they had got them transposed by some means in giving the numerous calculations. I stated to him that I had measured the distance on several globe maps with a fine steel line and they all told the same story. Further, I did not wish to publish a mistake of this kind, if such it was. To this last, and the first, I received the following pert reply. February 14, 1892 Alex. Gleason, Esk. Dear Sir, I have received both your letter. But having been away from home in my steamer, and when at home, very busy, I have been unable to attend to your request before this. In reply, would say that I don't pretend to know anything about working nautical questions with a tape line. Furthermore, am very much surprised to learn from you that Cape Horn is 200 miles nearer Cape Town than Buenos Aires. I don't take nearest points when working these questions, but degree of latitude and longitude. And if the following latitudes and longitudes are wrong, then the admiralty charts in my possession are wrong. Lat. Of Cape Town. 34,024s. Long, of Cape Town. 18 degree 32 E. Lat. Of B. Airs. 34 degree 30 S. Long, of B. Airs. 58 degree 00 W. Lat. Of Cape Horn. 55059 S. Long, of Cape Horn. 67 degree 12 W. If you can make Buenos Aires 200 miles nearer Cape Town from these figures, there is no need for me to work any questions for you. Please take notice that the questions worked for Yok were done so by Mercator's sailing chart, which is our usual way of finding course and distance from point to point. Allow me to say that Cape Horn is nothing more than a rock, so whatever point you take don't amount to a row of pins. Yours respectfully. Charles B. Brown. It was my interrogatory letter that has called forth these statements from Captain Brown, which to his mind did not amount to a row of pins, and perhaps had he previously known my purpose in calling forth these responses, the value of what I would have gotten from that source would have been less than the estimate that he has put upon it. Nevertheless, Captain Brown is all right with his charts, his degrees his latitudes and longitudes, also the time records which we next notice. Before going too far with the considerations of the relative or comparative time, mentioned by our challenger in the forepart of this article, under the indicator C, 
it will be necessary to notice the very best time ever made by the best crafts that float the northern seas, and perhaps the medium, also. We have entered no confederacy with steamship lines, but have procured some catalogues from which we have clipped two leaves for the benefit and interest of those who wish to be informed on these matters. First, we give one abstract of Log, Nordoyer, Lloyd's Steamship Line, Captain H. Helmers, from Southampton to New York. Actual time 6 days 22 hours 42 minutes. Average speed, 18.36 knots. Equal to 6 days 8 hours from Queenstown. We give the above log, that the readers may see and be able to judge, in regard to variations of the vessel's course from point to point or port to port. The following is a copy verbatim from the Hamburg American Packet Company's catalog, J. W. Clark, Agent, 70 Exchange Street, Buffalo, N. Y. Speed, these steamers have at once stepped to the front rank among ocean greyhounds, and must be counted among the fastest ships afloat. The best time accomplished was 6 days and 12 hours from New York to Southampton, being the fastest trip ever made between these two ports. This is equal to a trip of 5 days and 21 hours from New York to Queenstown, Southampton being about 300 miles east from Queenstown. The time by rail from Southampton to London is 2 hours. The landing arrangements at Southampton are considered superior to those of any port in England, the trains, starting from the docks and the Hamburg American Packet Company's special trains awaiting the passengers there. During the past three years steamers have maintained a regular fast weekly express service between New York, Southampton and Hamburg, taking passengers to London within seven days, and to Hamburg within eight days while the actual average ocean passage is reduced to a little more than six days. This line, according to the annual report of the United States Superintendent of Foreign Mails, takes the first place over four others in the conveyance of the mails between New York and London. Their great regularity is indicated by the fact that almost all trips were made within a margin of a few hours. The arrival at New York Southampton or Hamburg can therefore be easily forecast. Passengers leaving New York on Thursday are landed in Southampton on the following Thursday, reaching London on the same day, thus bringing them from New York to London in less than a week it has been done in 6 days and 16 hours, a feat not equaled by any other line. This shows the wonderful convenience which these steamers offer to the traveling public. The fastest runs were about 20 and 3 fourths knots per hour, which is equal to 2,336 English miles, and exceed the speed of transcontinental trains. Specimen Runs From New York First Bismarck, June 18, 91. 6D. 12H. 58M. Columbia, October. 9. 90. 6D. 15H. 0M. Normaya, November. 20, 90. 6D. 17B. 03M. August of Victoria, September. 18, 90. 6D. 22H. 32M. From Southampton. 1st Bismarck, May 9, 91. 6D. 14H. 15M. Columbia, June 27, 91. 6D. 15H. 58M. Normaya, May 21, 91. 6D. 16B. 45M. August of Victoria, October. 290. 6D. 22B. 30M. We will consider first, the build of these South Sea steamers as compared with those of our latest pattern. We are informed by the agent, Mr. J. 
W. Clark, and others tell us that these South Sea steamers are all built by the same class of builders, or same building company, on the Clyde in Europe. The steamship Abbey Town, we were informed by Captain Brown, was built by the East and Ia government for this special southern trade, and it is this that gives the best time on record in the southern seas. Between New York and Hamburg, and Cape Town and Cape Horn, there is but about I degree 30 difference, or say 100 miles, according to the globe measurement, that is, if we measure the difference from Hamburg to New York on a globe map with dividers, then place them on Cape Town and they will only lack about one degree and a half of reaching Cape Horn. Now, so far as danger or contingencies are concerned in making the voyages in a given equal time, the one preferred to the other, the South Sea has the advantage. This is shown on the navigator's charts, both in currents, rocks, shoals, islands, etc. This can be seen on the ordinary Mercator map of the world. The question now resolves itself to this, on the globe principle, Cape Town to Cape Horn 3600 miles, best time ever made 10 miles per hour, 335 hours equals 3,6 soy miles. If the above be true, the Cape Horn steamer was six days making up that existing difference of 100 miles in distance, under the most favorable circumstances, and this the very best time ever known. We will now look at the matter from another standpoint. We will allow the northern navigators all they claim tour distance and time. We now ask that the southern navigators and nautical inspectors be allowed their moderate claims for both time and distance namely, Cape Town to Cape Horn, 5,700 miles. Time, 13 days 23 hours equals 335 hours at 17 miles per hour, 5,695 miles. Is it not as possible for the South Sea vessel to make 17 or 18 miles per hour in an extreme case, as it is for the Northern to make 20 or 21 miles per hour? We leave this for you to answer. Inasmuch as we believe that we have, not only in this article, but previous ones, given sufficient evidence to more than overbalance every reasonable objection to our position, we will only ask of him who is still skeptical, the same that has been asked of me. Just stop and consider it, I say, for a short time and see if all these matters do not harmonize perfectly with philosophical and astronomical, and also with the experience of men who navigate the seas especially those south of the equator slash. A. As to the child of the dark ages we have a few words to say. The philosophy of Thales. Thales, says our encyclopedias, a native of Miltus, in Ionia, or according to some, of Phoenicia, the earliest philosopher of Greece and founder of the Ionian school, was born about 640 B. C died about 548, hence, he was about 92 years old at death. His philosophical doctrines were these, he considered water, or rather fluidity, the element of all things. He taught that all natural phenomena are produced by the condensation and rarefaction of water, and are resolvable into this element. Earth is condensed water, air is rarefied water, and fire rarefied air. If then, water is the origin of all things, it must not be considered as dead matter, but as a life-giving principle, which he also called the soul of the world or the divine principle. Thales taught that the universe was pervaded by demons or spirits not far out of the way here, and assigned a soul to inanimate objects. That this creative, moving, forming power was necessarily diffused and at work throughout the universe as an essential property of the original principle. Says the Encyclopedia Americana, the story that he foretold an eclipse of the sun, although he may only have indicated the year of its occurrence, implies a more correct knowledge of the solar system that he and his disciples appear, from the statements of Plutarch and Diogenes and Phlaotius, to have possessed that is supposing his prediction to have been founded on his own observations and calculation. 
If we return to the last part of chapter 17 and compare the record of Thales with that of Pythagoras, we shall find a very striking resemblance in the character of the two, so far as their ideas of divinity were concerned, at least, we are compelled to believe that they were from the region, not only of the Dark Ages, but mythological demons, inspired by Beelzebub, their chief and founder of the whole system of paganism, to which so many tenaciously cling. The Closing Consideration A Peculiar People here is a people scattered abroad throughout the earth, with whom I have had an acquaintance for over thirty years, who claim to be the antitypical Israel, and the depositaries of God's laws. They believe the promises are due to them on this wise, Know ye, therefore, that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Gal. 3 colon 7. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and unto seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. 16th verse. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Gal. 329. This people also believe that they are giving the last notes of warning prior to the appearance of him of whom it was said, whom the heavens must receive until the restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 5.21, Matt. 24.14, Dan. 2.44, 7 The latter quotation covers complete their anticipated hopes and joys of this present life and that which is to come. And the kingdom and dominion, and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Christ. Further, this people claim to be giving that everlasting gospel, styled the third angel's message of Reverend. 14 colon 6 to 12. Some prominent ones among this people have taught that this subject of the shape of the earth was no PIT of the third angel's message and therefore no part of the truth for them to receive, consequently, they are to have nothing to do with it. It has been an adage with some truth-loving people, that an unpopular truth was more acceptable than an unpopular error. We do find some, sorry to say, that cling to the popular error, at the sacrifice of the unpopular truth. While some are declaring that they have nothing to do with the matter, yet we still hear them preaching the earth a globe and are teaching it from their high schools and colleges. Now, this has long been their motto, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isa. 820. Having briefly noticed the future hope and reward of this people, we wish their forbearance while we notice the characteristics they are to bear. We would not by these words assume the prerogative of a leader or teacher of this people. God's word will teach and lead that will be led or taught by it. But allow me to call attention to that which is your delight and that which so many of you know so well. We ask what was to be the character of the church when presented to the master? Ephesians 5, 27, will tell us plainly, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle, or any such thing, but, that it should be holy and without blemish. Is the remnant to teach the truth only? We will let Zept. 3.13, Answer, The remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity, nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth allow a few more citations. What does the angel say to Saint? John. Reverend. 14. Last clause of the fourth verse. These were purchased from among men, to be the first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. 5. And in their mouth was found no lie semicolon, they are without blemish. NV. The Revelator says, Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. He also says, That without are every one that loveth band make per lie. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill?
he that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth been bisped. P.S. 15, I, 2. Actions, many times, speak louder than words, then, this being true, may not inspiration refer to the same? Yes, doctor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor? Last clause 3d verse. I understand by this, he who carries reports, whether he can sustain them or not by the word, does it at a peril? Apostrophe the Lord says by the prophet Zechariah, apostrophe these are the things ye shall do, speak ye every man truth to bis neighbor zech. 818. Then, can we teach our neighbors or family that which is not truth, and be clear in the sight of heaven, and further saith that Bible was not given to teach. Astronomy, and that it makes no difference to me whether this earth is flat or round? True, it may not make any difference to us in regard to its shape, but it will make a difference whether we speak, think, act and teach the truth or a lie. Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life semicolon no man cometh to the Father but by me. If we earnestly desire, seek and strive for it, the Spirit of truth will guide us unto our truth. See John 16, 13. Then, in view of even the very few declarations above given, do not say that the message and mission that we have to perform is separated from any truth necessary for us to believe and maintain against the author and the refuse of lies which are to be swept from the earth. In order to harmonize the scriptures to suit modern science, falsely so called, the world has gone contrary to all true principles of interpretation, thus have they made the literal rendering of no effect. We give an extract taken from an editorial in the Signs of the Times for May 19, 1890. I. The Bible does not simply contain the truth but it is the truth and the whole truth. And whatever disagrees with the Bible, whether it be in the realms of morals or science, must be false. 2. When a position taken in regard to any text is con, consistent with the entire Bible, that of itself is evidence that the position is correct. 3. The Bible must interpret itself, it cannot need the addition of matter outside of itself terms used in one place in the Bible with a certain signification, must have the same meaning attached to them in every other place where they occurred, provided the same subject is under consideration. We say, Amen. On the above principles let us examine a few texts of the word, and if we cannot maintain the above principles, then let us forever cease to contend and maintain the literality of the scriptures and meekly take our position with that class of investigators spoken of in Tim. 3 colon 7, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. A. Joshua 10, 12, 13. When Joshua spoke to the Lord and commanded the sun and moon to stand still did he mean the earth. B. 13th verse, and the sun stood still and the moon stayed is it true? Or did the earth stand still? Add thou not to his words lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. Prof. 30, 6. See Psalms 19 colon I to 6. In speaking of the glory of the heavens the psalmist says, In Themoth he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his percent chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, and his sift cue it unto the ends of it could our globe friends find such a testimony as this in the scriptures for their side of the question, we would have to acknowledge that we knew of no rules of interpretation for the word of God. Has inspiration used a medium through which to communicate to mortals, that would use other words than his, and words calculated to deceive? I cannot believe it. This would be science tells and teaches that it is the earth, and not the sun that moves. Then why not say so in that word that describes the glory of the heavens? Is it in the heavens that he set a tabernacle that visit the earth greater whose going forth is from the end of heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it? D. But, tenacious for your early instructions, 
and not content with other positive evidence to the contrary, you refer me to Job 26 colon 7, which says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Dr. A. Clark says that little the inversion renders it thus, He layeth it upon the waters, nothing sustaining it. This harmonizes with P.S. 24 colon 2, for he hath founded it upon the seas, and established it upon the floods. E.P.S. 78 colon 69, says, and he built his sanctuaries like high places, like the earth which he has established margin, founded, forever. Slash, does God here compare his tabernacle or sanctuary dwelling places? synonymous terms, to something that was flying through space faster than a cannonball, and turning around at the same time at the rate of more than a thousand miles per hour. Or should we understand him to mean the sun, when he said, P. Gee, but he hangs it upon nothing, is what you claim. Yes, and so do I. He done just as he said he did found it upon the seas, nothing sustaining it, nothing is a non-entity, then no human thing sustained it. You next demand the foundation of the seas. Well, I will give you just what God says about that, and I do not think that I am authorized to go beyond, for the secret things belong, unto the Lord per God, but those things which are revealed in his word, belong unto us, and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Dirt. 29 colon 29. Now, the prophet Jeremiah will be responsible for the following declarations, for he declares that it is thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, which giveth the sun for a light by day and the ordinances of the moon and of the stars for a light by night, which divideth the sea when the waves thereof roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances depart from before me, saith the Lord then the seed of Israel also shall cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus saith the Lord, if heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Jer. 3 colon 35 37. Yes, truly we may infer from the declarations of God himself, and his infinite works and wisdom, that if finite man, the work of his hands, formed of the dust, can search out infinity, then infinity has no more use for him, and he is independent of him who formed him. We can only say in conclusion, and this with the utmost confidence and with God's word to sustain us, that, first, there is foundation beneath, second, the heaven of heavens are above. Also, the everlasting bounds of ice that cover the deep are below the heavens. The waters are hid as with a stone, and the face of the deep is frozen. Job 38, 30. Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth, declare if thou knowest it all. Job 38, 18. He hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. Job 26, 10. The RV. Has it thus? He hath described a boundary upon the face of the waters, unto the confines of light and darkness. We cannot refrain from a few remarks on these harmonious quotations, there is no ambiguity here, there is no evading the conclusions if honestly considered by those who revere the word of God. First, it is true that day and night do not come to an end at the north, for it is well known to those living in Spitzgen as shown heretofore in this book that there is three and a half months day. Therefore, when day begins, night ends, and vice versa. Then no spot on this earth north of the equator does night and day end. But the infallible word of God says that those confines or bounds are upon the face of the waters. Now if the bounds are on the face of the waters, certainly they are the one side or the other of the equator. That path or bounds, no bird of prey knoweth, neither hath the falcon's eye seen it, the proud beasts have not trodden it, nor hath the fierce lion passed thereby. Job. 28, 7, 8. R. V. 
Sir James Ross advanced to 78 degree 10 south and there traversed a wall of ice estimated to be a thousand feet thick and from 150 to 200 feet high, for 450 miles without a crack or crevice sufficient for a row boat, gave up the search for any passage and returned. No human being, before nor since, has passed that wall God. In his wisdom built, and he has said, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further, and here shall thy proud waves be stayed. Job.38 11. In conclusion, suffer a few words, though in substance it has been repeated in this book, they have reference to the northern bounds as compared to the south. The North Polar Basin is circumscribed by the line of 80 degrees. Within the latter is the Open Polar Sea, which is nearly IOUU miles in diameter. Sir Edward Parry with open boats advanced in it toward the north to the latitude of 80 to degree 45, or to the proximity of 435 miles from the center, the nearest point ever reached by man. Seven his was between 1827 and 1829. Since that time, on May 13, 1883, Lieutenant James B. Lockwood and Scht. Brainerd pushed north to 83 degree 24. See following article by Mr. Lovell. The current flowing south was so rapid that it completely neutralized the northward progress effected by rowing, and the unsuccessful attempt was abandoned. Dr. Hayes reached 8 high degree 35 or within 505 miles. Mr. Morton of Kane's expedition attained 8 I degree 22 or within 518 geographical miles both Hayes and Morton, as far as they could observe, found no ice, but on the contrary, a warm open sea. Birds were flying north. Snow had melted from the mountains, leaving them clad only with a thin covering of ice. The established line of greatest cold on the American continent is 700 miles south of the North Pole and on the Asiatic 625 miles south. Professor F. Miller's Great Lecture, Harmony of the Bible and Natural Philosophy, page 45. We have seen by the above where the north boundary or limit of cold existed, and passed that extreme into that place inhabited by the birds of a genial climate, to an open sea, and there we leave those considerations of the two extremes of north and south. There remains another passage that has been misconstrued to prove the earth a globe, and has went the rounds of the papers, but has no bearing whatever. In order to show this we will take its connections. We will first look at Job 38, 12, Hast thou commanded the mornings in thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place? 13. That it might take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. Fourteenth. It is changed as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. In the new version, the fourteenth verse reads, It is changed as clay under the seal, and all things stand as a garment. Dow version reads, Twelfth verse, Didst thou since thy birth command the morning, and show the dawning of the day its place? Fourteenth. The seal shall be restored as clay, and shall stand as a garment. Fifteenth. From the wicked their light shall be taken away. How these expressions can be made to apply to anything but the light and its source, is beyond my comprehension. I will now close my remarks by quoting a few short paragraphs from a writer well known to all of the people of which I have referred. The truth and the glory of God are inseparable, it is impossible for us, with the Bible within our reach, to honor God by erroneous opinions. Many claim that it matters not what one believes, if his life is only right. But the life is molded by the faith. If light and truth are within our reach, and we neglect to improve the privilege of hearing and seeing it, we virtually reject it, we choose darkness rather than light. I there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Prof. 1625. Ignorance is no excuse for error or sin, when there is every opportunity to know the will of God. Great Controversy, p. 597
in Revelation 21, 22 referring to the new Jerusalem after it had descended to the new earth, the revelator says, and I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. The 23d verse, latter clause says, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. In 22 colon 3d verse we read, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him for, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in three foreheads. In great controversy, edition of 1888, pages 676 to 678, are the following remarks upon the above references. The people of God are privileged to hold open communion with the Father and the Son. Now we see through a glass darkly. I call. 13, 12. We behold the image of God reflected as in a mirror, in the works of nature and in his dealings with men, but then we shall see him face to face, without a dimming veil between with undimmed vision they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns, and stars and systems all in their appointed order circling the throne of the deity. Now we ask, if anyone can so construe the above quotations and language spoken, as to place the throne of God and his Son anywhere else than on this earth, when the restitution of all things shall have taken place. Advocate it who will, I cannot. In preparing this work for the public, the author has aimed for the diffusion of that class of knowledge and information which in its nature should contribute to liberty of the God-given conscience. If this effort shall contribute to enlarge our views and destroy prejudice, I feel assured that I shall receive the most gratifying reward for the few laborious days which have been devoted to the task of gathering these, disconnected though they may be, yet, vital and important facts. Alex. Gleason. January. 1893. 1201 Niagara Street. Buffalo, New York, U. S. A. Some semicolon points from popular sources. Selected and furnished for this book, together with additional remarks, by R. E. L. J. Love, that is, W. Var. The polar night in the highest latitudes begins in October J and lasts till nearly February. Then the sun appears slash each day, at first for a few moments only, and then longer and longer, till by May it does not set at all. For three months there is perpetual day, May, June and July. By the end of June the ice of the Arctic seas is commonly divided and scattered. Then there is excessive moisture everywhere. July is a bright month, and in sheltered spots the heat may become excessive. Lieutenant James B. Lockwood and Sergeant Brain are pushed north to latitude 83 degree 24, to an elevation 2,000 feet above the sea. The time was May 13, 1883. Curious as it may seem, there was no absence of animal life. Hares, lemmings, ptarmigans, snowbirds snowy owls, polar bears, musk oxen, and even vegetation were found. The potato is cultivated in favored spots in South Greenland, also turnips, cabbage, salad and spinach, barley grows, flowers bloom, berries mature, grasses grow on the slopes and along the fjords. Beech, birch and willow are found. Greenland is enclosed by two arctic currents apostrophe. Man has never yet gone northward of a spot where vegetation of some kind does not exist. What a contrast is presented in the Antarctic regions. No plant of any kind, not even a lichen or moss, has been found within 64 degree 12 south latitude, and while even in Spitzgen vegetation ascends the mountain slopes to a height of 3000 feet, the snow line descends to the water's edge in every land within the Antarctic circle and as to quadrupeds, no four-footed animal has ever been found beyond 60 degree of southern latitude. Antarctic navigators, with one exception, 
have failed to penetrate the ice barriers of the southern seas further than to the comparatively low latitude of 78 degrees N. The short, warm summer of the north which cracks the ice flows, starts rivulets upon the glaciers, encourages a burst of hearty flowers and grasses, invites all animal life to an annual visit, comma, which is unknown around the south. Only in one spot, to the east of Newfoundland, has a northern iceberg been known to descend as far south as 390. In the Southern Ocean they have been found off the Cape of Good Hope latitude 350, opposite the mouth of the Rio de la Plata, and within 300 miles of Tasmania. In 1775 Captain Cook discovered South Georgia, in latitude 550, not so far as Labrador Iceland, north. For we saw not a river or stream, he says. All the coves of the bay were the heads of glaciers of great height, from which pieces were continually dropping and floating out to sea. Wild rocks raised their lofty summits still lost in the clouds, and the valleys lay covered with perpetual snow. Not a tree was seen, nor even a shrub large enough for a toothpick. The only vegetation visible was a moss and a tufty grass which sprang from the rocks. Before this description could apply to northern lands, we must go to Nova Zembla, to Spitsgen, or as far as man has gone up the west coast of Greenland. At Kerguelen Land, 50 degrees south, Cook found the ground covered with snow in the middle of the southern summer. In Europe, the most southern glacier which comes down to the sea, is on the coast of Norway, 67 degree north latitude. In the Gulf of Apennines, on the west side of Patagonia, in latitude 46 degree 5 b, the same as that of Geneva, north, is a glacier 15 miles long and 7 wide, descending to the coast. In 1839, Dumont d'Urville sailed 90 miles along a lofty coast and named it Adelia Land, latitude 6 i degree 30 apostrophe, says apostrophe people's cyclopedia, pagem. It is a dead and desolate country, without a sign of vegetation. In 1840 Wilkes struck another part of this ice-bound coast, since called Wilkes Land, which he traced for 1,500 miles. Captain Ross, on January 9th equivalent to our July, at Victoria Land, 720 south, could find no harbor. Every indentation in the coast was filled with ice and drifted snow, to the depth of hundreds of feet. There was nothing to anchor to and no spot for human feet. At Upernavik, in Greenland, the same distance north, is a fisherman's village, and a summer of two to three months. Ross tried very hard to penetrate further south, but he was opposed by an ice barrier, without a break for 450 miles, and with precipitous edges over 180 feet in height. Antarctic winter scenes have never been sketched, for no man has dared to stay in their midst. Nature seems to say, in blasts of her southern seas, and crash of their icebergs, apostrophe thus far shalt thou come, and no further. Heavens, Earth and Ocean, by James P. Boyd, A. M. 1887, pp. 665 to 830. Also Cook's Voyages, pp. 248-280. The Earth is three million miles nearer the Sun in winter than in summer. Quackenbo's Natural Philosophy. Observe that this is said to be the case at the middle of the southern summer our winter, and that the South Pole is then inclined toward the Sun. If the earth were a perfect sphere, without elevations and depressions, the depth of the entire volume of water would be about 10,000 feet. Question Book on Physical Geography, by S. H. Craig, p. 262. Mount Dot Ararat, in Asia, is 17,210 feet high, Mount Dot Everest, 29,100. Mount Dot Aconcagua, S. A. 23,100 feet. Mitchell's Geography, 3rd Book, 1872. Now, 
there was a great flood one time. And all the high hills that were under the whole heavens were covered. General. 7, 19. The earth being a plain, stretched out upon the seas, Bible, the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and as the waters rushed in from the south expanse, they covered the earth like the ship borne down by the waves. Nothing else accounts for the vast animal deposits about the north. The incoming waters conveyed them there, and as the waters returned to the place from whence they came, very naturally left these deposits. These eruptions and retreats of the sea, have neither been slow nor gradual, most of the catastrophes which have occasioned them have been sudden. Traces of the antediluvian deluge are very conspicuous. In the northern regions it has left the carcasses of some large quadrupeds, which the ice has preserved, with their skin, hair and flesh. Doubtless these were preserved in evidence, to witness to the truth of God's word. Gleason. The elephant found near the mouth of the Lena, by Mr. Adams, in 1799, was in such high preservation that its flesh was eaten by dogs. Bufflong's Natural History. The greatest wonder of this bleak coast is its wealth of mammoth tusks. Along the shores of the Obi, Yenizi and Lena, and the shores of the polar ocean air found the remains of a species of elephant, embedded in the frozen soil or in the ice. In one of the Lacau Islands was found a deposit of mammoth bones of remarkable richness. In 1821, 20,000 pounds of fossil ivory were taken out, and the supply seemed inexhaustible. Not only fossil horses, buffaloes, oxen and sheep have been found, but wood embedded in the soil. The sand, stone of the high hills embraces woody beams and trunks. Lands of the Midnight Sun, pp. 809-811. James P. Boyd. Here we first got a cloudy, vague idea of what had passed in the big world during our absence. The fiction of its rotation had not much disturbed the little outpost of civilization. Dr. Kane, 1855, at Upernavik. The sun, moon and stars were regarded as subsidiary to the earth. There seems to be traces of the idea that the world was a disc. Smith's Bible Dictionary, p. 155. Astronomers are wont to be very precise in their calcul, lations, and boasted of their discovery of Neptune by prediction and calculation. It has been so taught in the schools. But, see Mitchell's Astronomy, p. 275. He says, aerial planet was found 5 billion miles distant from where the computed one was supposed to be. M. A. W. Please tell me two things. First, who discovered that the earth was round? Second, how can we prove by observation that the earth revolves upon its axis? The world owes not know, and never heard tell of anyone who could answer your questions. New York World, January. 22, 1890. M. W. The exact diameter of the Earth taken through the poles, is given out by astronomers at 7898.8809 miles, and at the equator at 7924.911. This is simply scientific swindling, nothing more nor less. It is a matter of theory only, and the bunco steerers in science, and particularly in astronomy, have things quite their own way. New York World, April 15-91 L. B. No one ever yet ventured a plausible theory to account for the Gulf Stream. Each theory put forward neglects some vital fact. The rotation of the Earth, the specific gravity of the differently warmed waters, and surface winds, have each in turn been proposed and abandoned. Captain. Nair's report in 1874 Challenger, shows that the three cannot even be combined. The least expansion of the Atlantic Ocean from heat is under the equator, at 70s. And there is more warm water at 230 N. than at the equator. At 38 degree N. 
the Atlantic is three and one half feet higher than at 230 n. Two and one half feet higher than at the equator, and if gravity compels water to run downhill then the Gulf Stream should flow the other way, while the equatorial bulge is in the temperate zone. New York World, 1890. They may be forced up northward by the cooler waters from the frozen southern seas spreading northward under the surface of the ocean, the earth being a plain. But gravity knocks out the popular theory. Mostly fools. Carlyle. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. I call. 319. Let God be found true, but every man a liar, that God may be justified in his ways. Rom. 3 colon 4. 4. Saith the Lord, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Isaiah. C. And confess, one comfort still must rise. Tis this, though man's a fool, God is wise. Pope. The Bible is a book worth all other oaks which were ever printed. Patrick Henry. The very first verse of Scripture is perhaps the most weighty ever uttered or penned, which, setting forth the five grand subjects God, creation, heaven, earth, beginning, is the germ of all philosophy and science, known and unknown, visible and invisible. Reverend W. Brookman, Toronto. Science in all its branches must ever be found to possess its origin in the word of truth. Such a principle may be opposed and clouded over by the temporary force of human imaginings, but sooner or later the Bible will be confessed to have been written for our instruction, and that whatsoever things were written for time were written for our learning. Apostrophe, Grisham. V. Many things that we now call discoveries are strictly speaking, recoveries and restorations of the past. There is no truth which is new, falsehood alone permits of invention, and is therefore evanescent and temporary, while truth is eternal, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Parallax. I would rather have one little promise in the corner of the Bible, than all the statements and theories of all the philosophers that ever lived. The history of philosophers has, in brief, been the history of fools. Each contradicts the other, and not a moon changes but finds a change in their doctrines. Reverend C. H. Spurgeon. It has ever been thus. Like the sands on the shore of the sea, they are continually shifting, has been the philosophy, learning and religion of the mystics, the pagans, the Greeks, and the Romans. What was once proclaimed from the high places, and believed on in the world so confidently, that he would be sent to the dungeon who would dare dispute it, is now so strongly condemned by the world that he would be put out of the synagogues of men who would dare believe it. But through all the rise and fall of the ages, and whilst system after system of the philosophy of the sages has had its day, and tumbled into the abyss of its predecessors, the Bible, effulgent with sparks of divinity, has presented one unsullied and unbroken chain of harmony, which shall, after the fullness of time of iniquity, bind Satan and his kingdom, and justify God as supreme. And it is not to be wondered at that the school of modern philosophers has been able to add but little to, while they have borrowed much from, the records of the ancients, who for fifty-five centuries held to the even tenor of the scriptures. Let us see. The signs of the zodiac were known to them as far back as the Deans. They divided the heavens into constellations, they discovered the planetary revolutions and periods, they discovered the great lunar cycle of a little more than 18 years, on the completion of which solar eclipses occurred, they as accurately calculated lunar eclipses, though they believed neither the theory of the sphericity of the earth, nor the theory of a stationary sun and a revolving earth. They were aware of the practical immobility of the pole star. They knew that the heavens completed a diurnal revolution in four minutes less five time than the sun, 
and hence that the sun lost a complete revolution on the stars in a year. They knew the moon lost a revolution on the stars in 27 and one half days, and on the sun in 26 and one half days, though these facts did not make them conclude that the sun and moon were going backwards. They discovered so called precision of equinoxes, and knew that the sun was longer, by eight days, north of the equator than he was south of it. Now, what do modern astronomers know, more than these things? With the possible exception of Uranus and Neptune, they had given us little else than planetary speculation on the hypothesis of Copernicus. The fact is, that they being called astronomers, and having been caught in the popular drift of science, and being entangled thereby, go on, of necessity, bringing forth one absurdity to support another, till their system of astronomy is not held together even by a fabric of the most base suppositions. They take up the terms attraction and gravitation, and spin our supposed ball through space with the rapidity of lightning, pushing, hauling and dragging with it the moon, the atmosphere and oceans, while clouds and currents of water are running undisturbed, at the same time, toward every point of the compass, without splitting the ball, as the natural result of such a rotation would be, into myriads of atoms, or sending broadcast through the universe a multitude of fiery meteors, but holding all unperceived, by gravitation and attraction, from a source a hundred millions of miles away, when no gaseous or luminous bodies have ever been found to possess attractive power. We can readily understand why we may swing a pail of water in a circle about our head, but how the pail can perform the revolution without the arm, or the water go around without the pail, is a matter that none but modern astronomers could dare declare, much less believe. Now, nothing seems plainer to me than that the facts are opposed to the theories hence the theories must be wrong, and, if wrong, Zetetis and the Bible is most likely right, if right, school children should no longer be compelled to believe that which astronomers have long known they cannot prove, a supposition to be a fact. Indeed, we think that we have reasons to believe that in the coming generations, the iron-bound shackles of prejudice and ignorance will be thrown off, and that the living objections now in the way of God's truth, will be removed by Father Time, that the throbbing that has sent the spirit of inquiry into the channels of intelligence will lead on, till once again shall be proclaimed that truth crushed to earth will rise again. R. E. L. J. Love. Vadis, W. Var. May, 1891. How the continents attract seas. Apostrophe The effect of gravitation in heaping up the sea waters upon the shores of continents is one of the most interesting, as well as the most curious and least considered facts in connection with old ocean's history. Thus the continents are all situated at tops of great hills or mountains of water, and to cross the Atlantic or any other ocean the ship has first to go down the sloping sheet, cross the valley and then climb the mountain of water on the other side before it safely reaches a harbor. In this connection the interesting calculation has been made that in mid-ocean on the Atlantic the depression is about three-fourths of a mile below the level of the water at coastline while a ship in traveling from San Francisco to Yokohama, Japan, must cross a valley at least a mile in depth. Saint. Louis Republic. How does the above harmonize with the globe theory? Author. Diagram number? 43 will be found convenient for getting the longitude in miles of any meridian north or south of the equator. As the earth has been repeatedly proven to be a plane, the lines of longitude are therefore straight, and they continue to diverge from each other at the same ratio as we go south, south of the equator, as they do from the north center pole to the equator. It will be seen, that for every five degrees of latitude, there is an existing divergency of three and one third miles. Example, commence at the top of the left hand column 90 degree and read to the equator O degree, 60 miles. Next, for southern distances, take the to right hand columns and read downward. 